Hello and welcome to Endzone. My name is Sam McWhorter. We're delighted to have you join us on this Wednesday afternoon and we're glad to welcome you to our first live episode this season. Today I'll be joined just after the break by our pro sports expert Saul Malik. We'll be talking about the McGregor-Khabib fight and we'll be talking about some rule changes in the NFL. Then we'll be taking a look at the MLB playoff push as the AL is officially all wrapped up. And finally, Jillian Creedy will be joining me to round off the show as we talk about all the happenings in Trinity Sports and where each team is headed next. It's all coming up after the break, but for now, kick back, relax. This is Endzone. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. All right, welcome back. I'm joined now by Saul Malik, our pro sports expert. Saul, let's get right into things. The Conor McGregor Khabib fight. This is a huge fight. Uh, Conor McGregor obviously hasn't been in the sport for a while. Give me your thoughts. Well, Dana White is actually calling it what should be the biggest fight in the UFC's history. So you already know how big it is if Dana's hyping it up this much. We have Connor 21 and 3 overall in his fighting, two of those losses before he was even in the UFC back in 2008 and 2010. So not really indicative of how he's been fighting. Khabib 26 0 and 0. Ten of his wins have been by decision. The other 16 all by either KO or submission. So yeah. Khabib, really big fighter. And this is going to be a really, really huge fight. I mean, first of all, all the trash talking between these two guys. I mean, you have yeah, Connor and this brutal. Connor in this giant incident where he and 20 of his goons go and attack a bus full of MMA UFC fighters, including Khabib. So there's a lot on the table here. Yeah, absolutely. And let's take a look at uh, Conor McGregor's last five fights real quick here. Um, he had that 2015 win against uh, Chad Mendez. That was a title fight. Then the 2015 win against Jose Aldo, another title fight. The 2016 loss to Nate Diaz, although that was not a title fight, so he didn't lose his belt. Uh, he did avenge that loss in 2016. Again, Nate Diaz a win, not a title fight still. And then that 2016 win, the last time he fought in the MMA, that win against Eddie Alvarez. And then now, 2018 Khabib Nurmagomedov. Let's take a look at uh, Khabib's record as well, actually, in the last five fights. So he actually has fought less uh, than Connor in since 2016. His last fight going back five is 2014, Rafael Dos Anjos. That was not a title fight. Then the 2016 Daryl Horsher fight, that was another win. Again, he's won all of his fights, so not saying much, but that was not a title fight. Uh, and then we have the 2016 Michael Johnson win, not a title fight, and then 2017 Edson Barboza, again, not a title fight, so a little bit of a lack of experience in title fights for him, and then the 2018 Al Ayakinta, that was the title fight where he won his belt, the one that Connor will be hoping to take off of him, and uh, really a, a stellar record for Khabib. You gotta say, which one of these fighters is better in the stand-up? Man, okay. This is a tough one because Connor obviously is out of practice for a few years, but that's not saying a whole lot. I mean, when he had his big money-making fight against Floyd Mayweather, obviously that was a boxing fight. Not really a huge loss for Connor considering he wasn't even supposed to do anything. He lasted nine rounds against him. Right. So obviously Connor trains hard even when he's not fighting in the UFC. And Khabib, man, Khabib has been just on a roll. Obviously hasn't lost a fight yet. I think Connor has a lot more in his arsenal than Khabib. Connor hasn't even shown everything he's capable of. He's considered to be both actually the superior striker and a superior grappler to Khabib. He just needs to hope that Khabib doesn't get him on the ground because that's when problems will start. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, uh, all of Connor's losses have come by submission. So definitely watch out for that. Uh, Khabib very good on the ground, like you mentioned. So that could definitely be a problem. Uh, we have a quote from Connor McGregor actually on why he came back. <laughs> I love this. Uh, Connor says, I came back for the love of this, to come back and shut this man up, a little rat, a little weasel. 
This I'm going to truly love putting a bad, bad beating on this little glass jaw rat. If that isn't classic Conor McGregor Saul, I have no idea what is. So um, this is a huge fight. I think we're all looking forward to I it. I just love Conor's mentality. Obviously, already proven so much in the sport. And to come back and fight this fight, clearly not for the money. I mean, he already has the money. He already has gotten the title belts before. This is just for the challenge. He's only in this because he wants to protect his legacy. Yeah, I think the rivalry between these fighters, the animosity they've shown towards each other might actually be real. I think he does not like this oh, man at all. Oh, definitely not. Definitely not. Yeah, this is not for show. All right, so uh, we're going to move on to the NFL. Saul, rule changes, controversy, you've got it all, huh? Man, this is really, really something that grinded up my gears over <laughs> the weekend. I'm never a huge rules guy. I never like when people say, oh, the refs are the reason we lost the game. No, it's because your team didn't play well the rest of the 40 minutes of the game. But Clay Matthews sacking Alex Smith in a game against the Redskins, I mean, looked like a pretty standard NFL-style play to me. And then flag out of nowhere for roughing the passer because I guess he dug his helmet, led with the helmet or something. And... This is the NFL, Sam. I mean, <laughs> yeah. do you pay linemen the big bucks to go out there and break through the offensive line to make tackles, to make sacks? And he did what he's paid to do, didn't go helmet to helmet, and they're throwing flags. Yeah, and I mean, the, the technical rule is actually that you're not allowed to land with your full body weight on the passer, which is ridiculous in and of itself. But then when you watch that play, he didn't even do that. I mean, you could maybe say he had half of his weight on him, but, I mean, this was a ridiculous call. You, I mean, you're right about that. And here's the thing. So the NFL is trying to be safer, right, Sam? And so they've already done stuff to initiate that. There's a kicking safety rules. Let me read it here. Under the new rules, five players on the kicking team must line up on each side of the kicker. They must line up on the 35-yard line, meaning that they can't get a running start. So that will prevent injury because a lot of injuries take place on the kickoff. And yeah. so this, the Clay Matthews hit, didn't cause an injury what you're doing here by making this call isn't preventing injury. I mean, you just want the guy not to sack the quarterback? I don't get it. And if we're going to go even further, I mean, the NFL just has a lot of issues with the, I guess, concreteness of their rules because there's yeah. a lot of ambiguity. I mean, let's go back eight years, first week of 2010, Lions against the Bears. Calvin Johnson did not survive the ground on what should have been a clear touchdown. And, I mean, the Lions didn't have a good season they went six and ten but that, that's not the issue I mean the issue is that Calvin Johnson got robbed of a touchdown that in the future many guys went and said this should have been a touchdown yeah absolutely it's just a the NFL I just think that they're not all on the same page they just can't be whatever's coming down from Roger Goodell it's not making it all the way and I, I just don't understand especially the the safety initiatives they just don't all make sense, like you said. I, just the the way that they're phrased as well, it's not football anymore. You know, there's some inherent risk. Obviously, you want to make these plays as safe as possible, but it's football, right, Saul? I mean, it is, and here's the thing. Even if you're going to impose these rules, you got to do it more concretely because as NFL fans, what we want is just some decisiveness. We don't want to hear the refs after every game saying, oh, we should have gone back and made this call this way rather than just saying, this is the rule, this is what's set. And we'll stop complaining because it's there in the rule book. If you're just making judgment calls every single time, I mean, what one ref says isn't what the other ref says, and it's both right or wrong, depending on how you look at it. So Yeah. All right. Well, we'll be back after the break. We're going to be talking about the MLB. Stick around. Awesome. You're still here, bro. All right, welcome back to End Zone. Saul still here with me. We're going to be talking about the MLB, the AL. Officially, the playoff picture has been wrapped up. Let's take a look at the standings right now. So we have the Boston Red Sox, 107 and 51. They're in first place. They're clinched. 
157 Houston Astros in second place. The 97 and 60 New York Yankees, they are in third place. And then the 95 and 63 Oakland Athletics are in fourth. And the 88 and 69 Cleveland Indians are in fifth place. That's your five playoff teams for the American League. Obviously, you have the um, Indians, the division winners, and then you have the Houston Astros and Red Sox, also the division winners. So this wild card game, Saul, New York Yankees versus the Oakland Athletics, how do you think that's going to play out? Man, it's been a long season, hasn't And the fact that the A's are where they are now, that's really impressive to me. I'm sure you've seen Moneyball, where they put together all the spooky, scrappy guys that can get on base <laughs> yeah. better than anyone else that have no name value whatsoever right and it's kind of been that way this year they've gotten guys like Matt Olson who had a pretty big rookie season last year Chris Davis consistently hits at least 40 homers a season and he's never talked about yeah. and then even the pitching Edwin Jackson who's got to be 40 something years old now he's bounced around just about the whole league he's been pitching pretty lights out I think he's on his 16th team yeah he's been through more than half the league and if that doesn't tell you anything about the guy I mean I don't know what does and you have guys like Sean Manea still pitching very well, and the whole team has just come together. Blake Trinan in the bullpen, ERA sub one, been a great closer. They've had Lou Trevino come up and win eight or so ball games out of the bullpen with a sub three ERA, and really, really impressive stuff from Oakland. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Matt Chapman, the biggest star for me on that Oakland team, just the defense that that guy brings to the table. I think last week we compared him to Harrison Bader, and they were kind of on the same playing field. They're just head and shoulders over any defensive player in the MLB, and he also has the offensive value to go with it. Um, super impressive, like you said, being able to scrounge together. This is a very low payroll, we should mention. This is the lowest payroll of any playoff team, and that's not easy to do. Uh, this is, I think, the 10th highest payroll or the 10th lowest payroll excuse me in the American League it's ridiculous the way that they've managed to cobble these players together again like you said uh, and that back of the bullpen is nasty there's a reason they call Blake Trinan the witch Saul <laughs> very aptly named nickname there but then Sam we have the Yankees against the A's and yeah. you know it's never an easy feat to defeat the New York Yankees the good thing for the A's is this is a one game head-to-head -head playoff series which means anything can happen I think the Yankees, I haven't looked at the probable pitchers yet. I think it's too early to look at that, given that the uh, end of the regular season is still concluding. But probably Severino, if I'd have to guess, against maybe Sean Mania. So I think that's that might be what we'll see. Yeah, I think it's uh, the way things are shaking out, it might actually be Severino versus uh, Daniel Megden. Oh, um, man, okay. So, uh, although Megden, to his credit, he's been doing very good this season. He has some great statistics, but um, maybe not the caliber of pitcher of Luis Severino. Although Severino has been struggling of late. I mean, he has been, you know, that slider has not been quite working for him, and that's kind of his uh, go-to pitch. So maybe a little bit worried about the pitching situation for both teams? I think Oakland's going to do what Tampa Bay had success doing all season and maybe run a bullpen game, run Daniel Mingdon out there for three or so innings, then go into that bullpen because it's one game. You have to win that game. doesn't matter if you have to go through your entire bullpen because then you get a few days of rest. I think they'll go through at least five or so relievers each run out there for an inning or two. I think that's how Oakland has to do it. And for the Yankees, if you get five or so innings out of Severino, then you go to that really nasty bullpen, too, and you just finish the game out that way. Yeah, and that bullpen for the Yankees was talked about before the season as maybe the best of all time. Obviously, it hasn't lived up to that, but now they have Zach Britton. <laughs> so yeah. uh, that is going to be really difficult to deal with. I think if Oakland doesn't get the lead early in this game, they're going to have a very tough time coming back. And uh, I could probably say that for either teams, but I think the Yankees, just with the power that they have, Aaron Judge will be back, they have young Carlos Stanton, uh, the young kids are hitting home runs. I just feel like maybe a little bit later on in the game, they get one guy on, they hit a home run, game, set, match. I'm going to say Yankees 7-3. Really? I'm going to say right. Yankees 7-3. I, I really want to see the athletic season continue, so I think I'll probably end up saying athletics lose by four to six, but be really unhappy about it. <laughs> you know, I, I would love to see them go on to that next round of the playoffs, face the Boston Red Sox, because I think that's a very interesting matchup as well, because the bullpen of the Red Sox is obviously a little bit weaker, and then you have the starting pitching of the Red Sox is maybe a little better, so some, you know, uh, competing strengths there for them. So I would love to see that. I don't think it's going to happen, though. I have it's to say one the game, Yankees win this. That's the beauty this. of it. Anything's possible. Well, and that's uh, one thing that the MLB, I really love that they've done. 
it could be anybody. So you have to go after that division win, or you could be out of there in no time. I mean, it could happen to anybody. The best team in the league, if you're in that wild card game, you could be out of there because the best teams lose to the worst teams quite a lot. That is true. I, I do agree with that. I think it's cool that it's just one game. It's like in the NCAA tournament, like Virginia losing to you, whatever. <laughs> UMBC, that's who they lost to right. by 20. And so the anything. school whose name we can barely remember. Yeah, I mean, there you have it. But also, um, man, now I lost my train of thought. I was going to say, Tampa Bay Rays almost snuck in there with their one starting pitcher the entire year. They used Blake Snell for about the entire season and successful. Yeah, a successful season for them. Unfortunately, didn't make it. Athletics Yankees, make sure to tune in for that one. I'm going to be right back with Kendall Nace after the break. We're going to be talking some Dane, Dwayne Wade. All right, Saul. All right, See you man. later. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to Energy Star light bulbs, and you'll realize just how much cash you are really burning through. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Endzone. Right now, we are going to uh, try something a little bit new. I'm going to be talking to uh, Kendall Nace, our specialty expert. Uh, Kendall should be in the pod room right now. Kendall, how you doing? Hi, I'm good. Uh, glad to be here. So, um, yeah, let's get to it. Yeah, all right. So, uh, Dwayne Wade is who we're going to be talking about. Uh, we know that he is an exceptional player, and with him coming back and to the Heat and his career coming to an end, what kind of impression did he leave on the league? Um, so I think he's definitely going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. Uh, you look at a guy, he's a 12-time All-Star, um, three NBA championships with the finals MVP in 2006. You got a scoring champion in 2009, um, two Olympic bronze medals, one in 2004, one in 2006 with Team USA, a gold medal in 2008. Uh, averaged 22 and a half points per game for his career, four and a half rebounds per game, five and a half assists per game, uh, one and a half steals, and about a blocker per game. Um, you look at his numbers in the playoffs, and they're pretty much identical. So what that has to say about him is that he's a guy who comes in, you know, he's consistent, uh, clutch, and can show up in the big moment. Um, he's the Heat's all-time leading scorer, all-time assist leader, and you look at the organization with players like LeBron James, Shaq, Alonzo Mourning, Gary Payton to the list. Uh, to be at that top of the list, it's, it's you know it says a lot about the guy. So um, yeah, we've seen that he's been able to be efficient with the ball, off the ball as a slasher while he got older. So um, yeah, I mean he's just been able to produce in all facets of the game. So I think he's definitely a first ballot Hall of Famer. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so what do you think that we should be expecting of him in his last year? Maybe looking to put himself among the greatest players ever in the shooting guard position. Well, I mean, I think we should temper our expectations a little bit just because, you know, he's older, uh, probably going to be around 20 to 25 minutes per game, which isn't bad for a player his age. Uh, you got the deep guard rotation, guys like Goran Dragic, uh, Wayne Ellington, Tyler Johnson, Deion Waiters, Josh Richardson. So the Heat have the luxury of resting him on back-to-back -back games, road trips, saving him for critical moments like the playoffs if they get there. Uh, maybe looking at a bench role even. I mean, like a Jamal Crawford, Manu Ginobili type role where he can provide, come in, uh, provide instant offense, playmaking abilities, experience for the younger guys. Um, and that's not a knock on him. That's just saying, you know, he's getting, I mean, he's getting older. So uh, probably looking at about 10 to 15 points per game with an occasional blow up of 20, 30 point nights. Um, and that's, you know, that's reasonable for a guy his age. So. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kendall. We appreciate you coming on and talking to us a little bit about Dwayne Wade. Excited to see how the rest of his season is. We're going to go to break, and then I will be back with Jillian Creedy. We're going to be talking about everything Trinity Sports and where every team is headed. Stick around. Listen to me. I am captain of the track team. And, and if I'm late, she doesn't I'm really think she's going to get out of here, does she? Be nice. She's new. Hello, is anyone there? Ooh. Wow. Even from our standards, you look awful. Oh, sweetie, what happened? Me? My friend Becky got to talk to this super cute boy, and I tried to act like I wasn't jealous, but I so totally was. And then out of nowhere, this concrete barrier just popped up. Maybe it was a semi. You mean you were driving? Well, yeah. I mean, I know the whole eyes on the road thing, but this was a super important text. Maybe you have to know, Becky. Texting? Great. 
but I, it was only like five seconds, and I'm a really, really fast texter, so it wasn't even a big deal. Actually, has she texted me back yet? Wow, I get like no bars in this place. I wonder if they have Wi-Fi here. Welcome back, everyone. I'm now joined by our Trinity sports expert, Jillian Creedy. Jillian, pretty good week overall for uh, all the Trinity teams. First up, we have women's tennis. They're in some pretty good form. Yeah, they looked good. Uh, Trinity hosted the ITA South Southwest Regional Championships this past Saturday. We had three of the four doubles teams in the A draw semifinals from Trinity, which is always good whenever it's a home tournament, um, get some fans out there. In those doubles, we had Mary and Zoe Caffin, um, twins actually, and doubles team that went eight and one to win over a pair from UT Dallas. Uh, then they defeated Trinity teammates, actually, Ashley DeBarge and Hannah Rafferty to get that title this past Saturday. Uh, DeBarge and Rafferty had upset a uh, number three seed from Austin College by a score of eight, and eight to six to advance to that final game. So that was kind of cool. Came up against uh, two Trinity teams in that last one. Fight to the battle. Uh, the Caffin Twins took it for that match. Um, another notable performance by sophomore Pauline Garcia, who emerged as the champion of the B singles with a 6-2, 6-2 decision to take that uh, to take that one and again over a Trinity teammate uh, Abby Watson so we had a lot of Trinity versus Trinity uh, competition this weekend which was cool to see cool to watch um, great atmosphere to go on to their SCAC games there yeah and absolutely an indication of just the amount of quality that they are if you're facing your own teammates as you of get course. towards the latter stage of the competition so uh, then we also have some uh, really quality teams coming up men's soccer let's go to them first men's soccer um, just I, you know, every week I'm just astounded again and again. They had two shutouts again, uh, starting with this past Sunday. They beat Johnson and Wales, which is a SCAC newcomer from Colorado. Shutout of 7-0, to zero, which is, again, amazing. And another uh, amazing statistics was their shot on goals. Um, their <laughs> yeah. offensive depth and skill this season is just unbelievable. Shots on goals came down to Johnson and Wales with five Trinity University with 50. So again, <laughs> just an astounding statistic that they just keep coming back and back. Another thing that I love to see is the spread from the goals. We have goals from seven, six different players, and that just really shows how deep the team is, how just it's not just one or two. It's everyone is contributing. Um, they're really getting out, getting after it. Um, and then again, with a shutout last night against Shriner, uh, five to zero. Um, again, those goals were spread over four different players. Um, and then it just shows that really just talent on the offensive end. And I mean, shutout after shutout means defensively too. Uh, we have goalies Blake Lieberman and Michaela Taylor, who were both strong players last season, back again, um, doing great, obviously, with those ending scores. They are now ranked uh, sixth nationally, undefeated in SCAC, and yeah. then just individual players. I mean, we have Andrea Kodispati, excuse me, um, who not only got Scott SCAC Offensive Player of the Week, but got NCAA Division Three Player of the Week, which is just crazy because it goes over all conferences across the nation. Um, huge accolade for that player and the team altogether. So yeah, and let's awesome. take a look at actually those uh, Division Three men's soccer rankings. We have Chicago in first, Messiah in second, Emory in third, Calvin at fourth, uh, Tufts at fifth, and then there we are, Trinity University 6-0-1 in sixth position just ahead of Lynchburg, Kenyon, St. Joseph's, and Franklin and Marshall. So really impressive for them. Let's go through these uh, a little bit quicker. We have women's soccer. Yes, women's soccer, again, two shutouts awesome weekend uh, for them. Johnson and Wales 9-0 to zero, and beat Shriner last night 3-0. Uh, to zero. So again, two shutouts. Uh, more concentrated on the goals, but some standouts. Chelsea Cole, three against Joss Johnson and Wales and another one last night against Shriner. That got her the Offensive Player of the Week for SCAC. That, uh, that game on Sunday was actually their 100th consecutive SCAC victory, which is a really cool statistic, I think, um, to get those Victories back to back. They are now nationally ranked at 21st and also undefeated in SCAC. So just amazing across the board soccer wise for Trinity this weekend and as they go on. Um, they're really looking strong. Have a couple players that just are 
scoring the ball. Uh, Chelsea <laughs> yeah, and Halleander with uh, three against Johnson and Wales and two against Schreiner. So. Yeah, and then we also have volleyball as well, and uh, volleyball is looking pretty good as well. Yeah, volleyball had a little bit of a tougher weekend, went 2-2 two and two up in Illinois, but not bad. Um, they had the two teams they lost to were both top 20, so, you know, it's tough competition. And then they just had to get used to it, came back, won the last two in the tournament. Um, again, not bad. Some notables was first year um, Emily Ellis, who we haven't heard much from her, but I think she's going to make a big splash here. She came out with the team best, 12 kills, 4 blocks, which uh, put her on that all-tournament team, which is great. And considering she's a first year, the only one on that team from Trinity is really a cool thing to do. So that's... It's a great weekend for them. I mean, I think it's pretty solid. You yeah. know, came back two and two, not bad. And unfortunately, we aren't going to have enough time to talk a lot about open water, but can we just a uh, quick sentence about that? Of course, yeah. Open water, cool competition. We had Trinity Junior Jacob Hurl Zeidelman come in eighth place for this rigorous 5K event um, hosted by University of Kansas D1 and D2 competition. So coming in eighth with a time of 59 minutes, 50. 52 seconds, and uh, not bad. That's really impressive. Yeah, pretty <laughs> impressive. All right, so what's coming up for all of these teams? Coming up, we have uh, tennis. The Caffin Twins qualified for the ITA Cup, which is going to be October 11th, which is awesome. We wish them the best of luck as they go on and uh, represent Trinity in that national tournament. Um, volleyball getting back to SCAC play. They're playing against University of Dallas this weekend. Um, Dallas is a great team. They're 8-4 and four right now. I think that'll be... A, it'll be a test for them. Um, I really think they can come out strong, though. Um, soccer, both teams gaining momentum as they go into a two-week away back-to-back uh, -back travel. Um, men's and women's, both against Austin College and University of Dallas. Men's, I think, can go either way. I mean, both teams, uh, or excuse me, Trinity is just strong as just heck right now. They're just <laughs> moving through the Absolutely. teams. Um, both of their teams are just you know getting there uh, but the women I think they have they have a great week coming um, both teams I mean Austin College hasn't gotten a win yet so I think they have some positive outlooks coming for all them. right and then really quickly I have to mention football uh, this game against Birmingham Southern uh, who do you think is gonna come up on top on this you know one? I'm gonna go with Trinity uh, Birmingham has a strong offensive team but you know I think defense wins games and when it comes down to it uh, Trinity allows uh, points, less points and pass percentages in the games, and I think that's really going to come out on top and really show this weekend. All right, thank you, Jillian. We are going to be back next week with End Zone. See you then. All right, well, a big thanks to Endzone for that. I'm Sam McCorder. Welcome into some Trinity football today. Saw a little bit of a pregame there. They snuck it in right at the end. Talking about this game right here, Trinity University Tigers 1-2 and two, taking on the Birmingham Southern College Panthers. Should be a pretty good game for you tonight. Trinity obviously coming off of that tough 10-7 to loss in its last outing. Millsap's field goal in the final seconds to earn that victory fourth straight time in the series that the game was decided by four points or less and that is the third loss in the last four meetings for the Tigers so a bit of a rough start for the season for the Tigers and really that loss against Millsaps Field, and that's why we're here at Alamo Stadium on their turf field. That field is just pretty much destroyed at the moment and uh, really just unplayable. Thankfully, we were able to make the quick move over here to Alamo Stadium, get to play on some artificial turf, and hopefully that'll result in an easier game for both sides and certainly one with less risk of injury. Trinity looking to solidify its offensive record a little bit more in this game and see more what they're capable of uh, as the last game probably not indicative to an extent. However, they do only have one touchdown in the fourth quarter this year, so 
Not expecting any huge comebacks or anything like that. Meanwhile, the BSC Panthers 2-1 and one on the season coming into this game. They had the win 34-28 at LaGrange, 41-35 at Huntingdon. And then they also had the loss to Rhodes. That was on the 22nd of September, 10-29, that one for them. So both teams coming in off of a loss, both looking to rebound. Trinity University, of course, this is going to be the, I believe, the eighth meeting between the Birmingham Southern Panthers and the Trinity University Tigers. And the Tigers have won the seven previous meetings, so they're looking to continue that streak. Of course, each of the last four were decided by less than ten points. So this should be, no matter what, an entertaining one. Although the Tigers would like to think that this is a victory that they can grab, get their season a little bit more back on track. Bit of an inauspicious start. And we will certainly see that for them. Let's go through some probable starters for both teams. The Trinity offense, you'll have Wyatt Messick probably back at quarterback number nine. And he'll be flanked by Evan McDowell at running back. Probably Garrison Meeks will take up that fullback role once again. And then out in the wide receiving core, Tommy Levine. Tommy Levine, by the way, became the 14th player to eclipse 1,500 career receiving yards. Seems like every week he is setting himself a new standard and a new record in the record books. So obviously one to watch every time the Tigers take the field. Chris Stewart, number 22, the wide receiver on the other side for the Tigers. Stewart has the second most yards total of any Tiger player other than, of course, the quarterback. So he's just behind Evan McDowell. And we have Elliot Blott probably at tight end, Brad Long at tackle, Brady Blanton on the other side at tackle, Joel Holmes, the guard, Patrick Quintana, the center, and William McElvogue at the other guard position. And then, of course, we'll have Jonathan Reyes kicking. As for the Birmingham Southern offense, we'll have Trevor Oaks coming in at quarterback. Oaks having a pretty decent season so far for the Birmingham Southern offense. And then they'll have... Robert Shufford at running back. He is a shifty player, one to watch out for, certainly as this game gets underway. And then they'll have Ford Hirsch at tight end, Buddy Dowd at wide receiver, Wells Smith at wide receiver, and Cole Merrill at wide receiver. They do tend to try and run a four, ride, four wide, excuse me, maybe a little bit more of a spread type of offense at times. Alex Luter, Derek Maddox, Chad O'Melia, Chandler Pierce, Spencer Schofield. That will be the offensive line. And then Ryan Ryder Andrews should be the kicker and punter for that Birmingham Southern offense. As the Trinity Tigers start to make their way out onto the field. Got about five minutes before this one. Looking good. Those nice red helmets. Back to the starters. Trinity defense will probably be Sei Soyebo at defensive end. Michael Inko at defensive tackle. Matthew Willis as the nose guard. Of course, they play that four up front system, so Kale Ridge will be the defensive end on the other side. And then Cullen Johnson, Aaron Hale, Robert Kuhn, the linebackers in that 4 3. And then Vale Meesfield, Kadarius Lee, Nick Hover, and Eddie Luna, your back four, if you will. T.J. Ranizeski back as the punter. Birmingham Southern defense. It's going to be Reggie Norwood at defensive end. He can certainly create some havoc off of the edge there. Birmingham Southern also playing a bit of a 4-3. Uh, Cy Butler in at linebacker behind that front four. Garrett Stevens at linebacker. Miles Myers as well. And then in front of them, Mitchell Milovich, defensive tackle. Corey Robinson, defensive tackle and Blake Loveless, or excuse me, Blaine Loveless at defensive end. That back four is going to be Matt Byers, partnered with Wes Guilford at cornerback, then Dylan Main at free safety, Ivan Villagius at strong safety, and Ryder Andrews again, punter and kicker. So that will be your probable starters. Of course, we don't 
know who will actually start on the field quite yet. But that's the best guess that anyone has of this moment. As we're about to prepare for the captains to walk out onto the field for both teams. And there go the referees. Captains for Birmingham Southern look to be number 11, Cy Butler, number 96. That would be Mitchell Milovich. Number 10, that would be Trevor Oaks, who we mentioned. And number 18, Buddy Dow, the wide receiver. Captains for the Tigers will be number four of McDowell. No surprise there, Tommy Levine flanking him. Number five, number 16, will be Jordan Williams. And number 98, who is, of course, the incomparable Michael Inko. So they get prepared for the coin toss here. And there it goes. Trini would probably like to have the ball to start this one. Get off to a strong offensive start. Take control of this game from the very get-go. Being decided as we speak. And there we go. Sides have been chosen. So Birmingham Southern has actually elected to defer. Trini will receive on that side of the field. And so we will be looking at this Trinity offense early on and perhaps get a good gauge of how locked into this game they are. And like I mentioned a little bit beforehand, so important they get off to a good start get into the flow of this game. Scoring by quarter generally tends to be a bit slow in the first quarter and then really heating up in the second and third. But they can come out, look like they're on top of things from the start. That would be a huge boon to this offense and perhaps a little bit of a reversal of pattern. Which you have to think would benefit them. Birmingham Southern's defense a little bit questionable as well, often giving up more yards than the offense is able to gain. So despite the good record on the year so far, they've certainly not had the easiest time of things. Certainly don't have a blowout win on their record like Trinity does against McMurray, that 44 to nothing. This looks like it'll be the kickoff coming from Hayden Terrell, the 6'4 junior from Fairhope, Alabama. Back to receive for the Tigers looks to be number 22, Chris Stewart. I believe that's number 28. Eight. Edmondson. This is a short pooch kick. And not taken on the bounce yet. Finally picked up and very small gain there. That was Michael Edmondson on the return. So not amazing field position given the kick, but not the worst 
that could have ended up out of that situation. Always dangerous as that ball starts to bounce around. If you take a look at it, Trinity was not prepared for this short of a kickoff. They let the returner get to it anyway. Unfortunately, had to wait for it to bounce twice until he could pick it up, and at that point, defense was set. Here's your first snap on the game for the Tiger offense. This is going to be a handoff to McDowell, and he is tackled in the backfield. Or it looks like possibly a loss of one. Essex looked like he was calling an audible there to start off. Or perhaps getting the offensive line set. And then the snap to McDowell. 96 initially blew up that play, allowing some other defenders a chance to get through. Of course, Mitchell Milovich, one of the captains. McDowell another carry. This one's slightly more successful, but... Not what they were looking for, certainly. As a couple of substitutions come onto the field for this third down, Birmingham Southern has been known to play a little bit different style on third down, try to limit the passing of these offenses. McDowell once again lines up next to Messix. Messix in the shotgun, two to his left, one to his right. Excuse me, two to his right. And he's going to have to scramble for this one. The ball comes out, and it is, I think, recovered by Birmingham Southern. Little... Yeah, it looks like there we go. There's the referee's call. So that is going to be a turnover for Trinity and certainly not the hot start they were looking for. Messix looks like he gets pushed out of the pocket, but at this point looks to throw once again. That leaves the ball exposed. And... That is going to be Birmingham Southern ball. Probably at that point should have just looked to run with it. On side, of course, though, is 2020. And this is our first look at the Birmingham Southern Panther offense. Trevor Oaks lines up to take the snap. Shufford to his left, and they're going to hand it off to Shufford. Shufford got a little bit of room. He burst through the defense. Gets almost all the way down to the 10. And I mentioned it before the game, Shufford very shifty. And you have to watch out for him, especially on those runs that have a tendency to create gaps up the middle of the field where he can go either to his left or his right with a move. Three to the right here for the Panthers all bunched up in a trips formation, and they're going to run it once again. Shufford looking for any room he can, but tackled in the backfield. Beautiful wrap-up tackle there by Robert Kuhn. The senior defensive back. So second down and nine. Ball on the 12-yard line. Play call coming in from the Panthers' sideline. Number 34 now in the backfield. That's Zach C. And snap, looking left and throwing left. Unfortunately, no catch made. Decent throw out there. Well, Smith just not in the position for it. You can see this is almost sort of a pick play, though, as Oaks drops back. He's looking left the whole way, and then there's that little bit pick. And maybe a little bit of a slippage or maybe just a little bit of miscommunication. Snap back again, looking right, and this one is caught down to the two-yard line. Birmingham Southern offense looking very good. Gentry Nice getting that one. And the training defense so far, no answer. For this Panther offense. Once again, sees in the backfield behind Oaks. To the left. And they're going to give it to Seas, and I think he's in. There we go. There's a signal. And touchdown early for the Panthers. And if you went to go grab a sandwich because you thought Trinity had the ball. 
probably coming back a little confused right now. Let's take a look at this one. Some good blocking up in the middle, and that gap just opens up. Not much you can do about that. And it's difficult when you only have about 17 yards to defend within. Kick is up, and it is good. So that'll be 7 nothing with 12 minutes left in this first quarter. Birmingham Southern, that was a 29-yard drive. Minute 30, the time of possession there. So a quick strike. And Trini's bench looking frustrated at the moment, and you can't blame him. I believe this is looking at the fumble once again. And there's the awareness to just take it and run. He looked like he may have been looking down the field at that point, but at a certain point, you just have to pull the ball down and say, this is it. Trey's receiving team lining up a little more forward this time. Better gauge of the kicker. And here comes the kick. This one a little bit deeper than last, but about the same position. Caught on the fly this time and making his way through and just about dragged down is Michael Edmondson. Dragged down by number 47, Justin Robertson for the Panthers. And you see they were able to set up a little bit higher up. A little bit of a seam up the middle, and it looked like if he just hadn't gotten grabbed by the jersey there, he might have had at least another 10 yards. So some fine margins there. In the pistol now for Messix. And a fake to McDowell. He's going to look upfield, and this one is caught. Unfortunately, not for a huge gain, but a completed pass. And who else but Tommy Levine? Good play design here. The fake in and the fullback looking on the low route, and Tommy Levine on the comebacker on the other side of the field, just a little bit deeper. So, two options there for Messix. And that's good for your young quarterback sometimes. Just give them two options. They pick between the ones they like. And if not, they go for a run. Here goes McDowell, though. And he has burst through the middle. Had a little bit of space there. And that is going to be the best offensive play by far so far for Trinity. Perhaps that completion inspired a little bit more confidence. This time they do hand it to McDowell. And you can see he has blockers all the way up the field. Looks like a tackle there might have been made by Garrett Foley, or excuse me, by Wes Guilford for Birmingham Southern. Another run here, McDowell, not quite as much room, but will get some yardage. And this pistol formation doing quite well for the Tigers as of now. Although with a couple of wide receivers coming onto the field, it looks like they may be switching out of it. Garrison Meeks jogging off there is usually the sign for that. And indeed it will be. They'll go back to the shotgun four wide. And Messick's definitely looking to throw here. Looking left. No room there. Could get sacked here and hangs on to the ball this time. Gets himself a gain of what may have been one or two. Looked like this may have been a planned rollout with McDowell shading that way, but McDowell misses his blocker, and Messix has to come back the other way. And that's a little bit unfortunate. This time in 11 personnel in the shotgun, Messix drops back, looking right, looking left, got nowhere to go, trying to evade a tackler, and still looking to throw, gets it off, and... 
I think that's going to be out of bounds, but heck of an effort play from Tommy Levine down the field there. Once again, Birmingham Southern getting pressure with only four. Playing a little bit of contain behind the quarterback. And then Messick gets popped as he lets go of that one. Levine does come down with the ball, but unfortunately he is out of bounds. Looked like there was a penalty there as well. That we must have missed. I believe that would have been holding number, I think the referee said 72 on the offense, which would of course be Joel Holmes. And Trinity is going to play a short field punt here. Snap down. And this one looks like it's a bit too deep. And it is. So that's going to be a touchback. Branizeski just a little too much power on that one. And Birmingham Southern will have some standard field position to work with. Although I'm sure the Tiger defense will be happy that it is a little bit better than last time out. I say a little bit. The field has been entirely flipped. Trinity offense looking a little punchy early on in that drive and then ultimately petering out. Looked like perhaps they had some good momentum going there with the pistol formation. Perhaps should have stuck to it. Trips to the right now for Trevor Oaks. And Birmingham Southern in the shotgun. They're going to hand this one off to Shufford again. Late decision, though, by Oaks to give it away. And look at Shufford keeping his legs churning, gaining a couple. He was really stopped in that backfield, but kept the legs churning and got himself a couple of yards. But you can see Oaks make this decision just a little bit late. He needed to make it a split second earlier than that, and by that time the hole was already closed up. But Shufford just going for it. Little Adrian... Peterson-esque there. And now Oaks will come out of the same formation. This time he does make the decision quickly. Shufford has a little bit of run in the room. And he'll get out to about the 25. So it'll be third down and five now for this Birmingham Southern offense. Watch the blocking scheme here as both the guard and the center, excuse me, pull out. And that gives Shufford just enough room. If the center hadn't bumped into the guard there, he might have had even more. Three to the right for Oaks now, and he's looking that way. Although he's going to be flushed out of the pocket, and that looked like it was thrown away, but a receiver just barely in the area enough. And look at both players streaking through the offensive line in that one. Really good play by the Trinity defense, and they will hold here. So the punter, Ryder Andrews, who also kicked that extra point a little earlier on, will be kicking this one away. And I believe that's Edmondson back to return for the Tigers. Here's the punt. And it is a bad one, shanked off to the right, and that is going to go out at the 44-yard line on Birmingham Southern side of the field. So no chance for a return. And you can see this one just comes off the side of the foot, spiraling awkwardly, and there it lands on the top right of your screen, kicking into the Birmingham Southern bench. So the best field position that the Tigers have had all day Not too far removed from where they ended their last drive, actually. So we'll just call this picking it up where they left off. Messick's in this shotgun formation again. Quad wide receivers, and this one off to McDowell. Got some blockers on the side, but that is a poor decision from him. Trying to reverse field, and he is going to lose several yards. And this looks like it's going to be about... Second and 15, but he has blockers, needs to go now. Tries to bounce it out to the outside further and then tries to run around. And when you have that many blockers in the area, you know you also have that many defenders. So you have to make your decision quickly and start getting upfield. 
In 11 formation now are the Tigers. One running back, one tight end. Messix is going to fake the handoff, take it. This one looks like it's going long. It could be to Stewart. And he's caught it, I think. Oh, my goodness. What a beautiful throw. Chris Stewart with the catch as well. This one into double coverage just over the top. The speed of Stewart, and he gets brought down at the one-yard line. What a beautiful catch and throw. And Tigers have already run a play while we were looking at how beautiful that one was. We'll take a look at it. It was just a quick snap to Messick's trying to catch the defense off guard. Didn't work out. Although it looked like they may have gained a couple of inches, so that's always nice. Fullback coming onto the field for the Tigers. Garrison Meeks, so perhaps a return to that pistol formation. Of course, pistol being the running back directly behind the quarterback when the quarterback is not under center. And indeed, it will be that pistol formation. So looking to run left will be McDowell, and he is wrapped up. Looks like he could have broken the plane with a second effort there, but ultimately wrapped up and tackled. Good push from this Birmingham Southern defensive line. You can see them moving that line of scrimmage backwards. And McDowell almost got in there. But not quite, so Trey's off and stalling on this one yard line. Meek's still on the field, so it looks like no matter what, this is going to be a run of some sort, although Messick is in the shotgun, and it is a run. It's going to be to the right side. McDowell can't get there. Loses yards, in fact. And they did go towards Meeks' side of the field. If you watch him, he's there at the end of that offensive line. He's got a blocker in front of him, and McDowell goes right. It's the sweep play. He doesn't take it wide enough. That's the issue, actually. On that play, you have to take it a little bit wider because there's going to be a scrum right in front of you. They're allowing that middle of the line to be pushed inward so you can go around it. And McDowell looked like he just cut upfield a little too soon. Tigers are going to go for it here on fourth down, though, which makes all the sense in the world as no matter what, you're just giving them bad field position. Messick's, though, under pressure, and that one almost intercepted as McDowell falls down in the end zone. So a very disappointing end to that drive if you're a Tiger fan. And just look at the push that this defensive line gets from Birmingham Southern. Four players around the quarterback there, and McDowell falls down in the end zone, so he didn't have a play on it anyway. But even if he did, he was double covered. And we'll now see this Tiger defense once again. Of course, a successful outing for them on the last drive. And we'll see if they can do much the same here. Always a bit nervy when your offense is sitting on its own one or two yard line. And here we have some footage again of that last game, the field. You can see so different from this one. And we got some rain this morning as well, so that field would have been unplayable. That's why we're here at Alamo Stadium. And this is going to be a run and a good one at that. Going to be about a five yard gain. I believe that was Zach C. Coming out of the pistol formation of their own. And the cut up field, beautiful for him. Gap opened up by the offensive line, just enough for him to get through. Now in the shotgun, two tight ends. Once again, going to be a run to C, and he gets a couple. Although that one is better dealt with by the center of the defensive line for the Tigers. A couple of substitutions coming in for the Birmingham Southern offense. Shufford in once again in the backfield. We know that he can be dangerous when given a little bit of space. Two tight ends once again, so it looks like probably a run. Maybe out to the quarterback's right coming across the field. And it will indeed be that Shufford making his way upfield. He looks like he's gotten the first yard by about two yards. And I believe that's right as the referee comes in to make sure. Good push there from that offensive line. Guard pulling, and you can see him getting in front of Shufford very well. 
and Shufford the speed to come around that gap. Looks like it could be a similar play here. Although this is going to be a pass, and there's a man open, although it's not a goal. Oh, my goodness, did he catch that? No, he did not, but my goodness, what an effort. That would have been one of the most spectacular catches I've seen in a long time from Buddy Dowd. Oaks is looking his way the whole time, and the throw is bad, but look at that. Just bounces off of his hands, but the fact that he was able to get a hand on it at all was pretty impressive. They're going to stick to this shotgun formation. Two receivers to the right in 21 personnel, two tight ends, one running back. And this is going to be another handoff, this time a fake to that side, and Shufford has nowhere to go. So he might have just lost a yard there, actually. So it'll be third and 11, it looks like, for the Panther offense. Let's see who blew this one up. And it looks like it was number 59 streaking through the offensive line there. Aaron Hale. Empty backfield now for the Panthers. Five wide receivers, lots of options, and a poor pass once again, albeit under a little bit of pressure from Trevor Oaks. Oaks here three to his left, but looks right the entire time. Knows exactly who's going to. Another pick route looks like from the Panther offense. Of course, we mean by pick route that the wide receivers cross paths trying to almost like as in basketball set that pick with one wide receiver to break him away from his defender. Nevertheless is going to be fourth down and another punt. This one again not great although this gets a great bounce and that's going to come back to the 36 yard line or the 37. This one going end over end. Not getting the extension on the punter, but that gets an amazing bounce. Look at that. Over 20 yards of roll on that one when it could have just as easily bounced backwards. So some luck for this Panther defense. They'll have a little bit more field behind them to work with. And as for the Tiger offense, looks like they're going to come out of a uh, pistol shotgun hybrid formation. Two receivers to Messick's is left, but this is going to be a handoff the whole way, and unfortunately nothing doing there for Jay Foster. Of course, we know Jay Foster, when he has a little bit of space, do a little shimmy and shake and get out of it, but the block missed there by number 72, Joe Holmes. And that allowed... Miles Myers, the linebacker number 40, to come through and blow up that play. Probably just needed a chip on him, and that would have been it. Four wide here for the wide receiving core. Jay Foster splits out as well. Messick is going to have many options. Looks down the field once again, gets his man, and he has some room to run. Could be down the right sideline to the 30 almost. And that is a beautiful catch and run there by, I believe that was Peyton Tuggle who doesn't get a ton of play in this offense, but breaks one tackle and then has some room to run. And just about gets down the sideline. On to the next play. Messick has some room to run as well. He's down this right sideline, almost to the 10-yard line. And all of a sudden, the Tigers finding a ton of room out there. This one is a fake screener. It may have been an actual screen, and it just got blown up. And Messick takes it himself when no one was expecting him to. Not entirely sure if that was intentional or not, but if it wasn't, amazing awareness from the quarterback and the ability to get through the line. It looked like everyone was just stunned. In the pistol formation once again, Foster behind Messick. Foster the run. He's got blockers, but he is going to be tackled in the backfield by several Panther players. Among them, Cy Butler, one of the captains. And this run to the right bounces it outside. Could have cut it back a little bit earlier instead, just chopping his feet on the right side. Now they're going to go 
No, they're not going to go trips to the left. Tug a little bit confused, so we'll have four wide for the Tigers in the shotgun. Foster splitting out wide once again. He'll be the breakout option. Messick's looking for something, not going to get anything in sacked. By Jayon Neely, number 95. Looks like the play design there is for Foster to split out and be almost a sort of a screen option there for the Tigers if Messick doesn't have anything initially. And he didn't, so he probably should have used him, but that'll bring us to the end of the first quarter. So the Tigers trying to even up the score here, although it will be third and 15. Offense has looked fairly dangerous on these last two drives, but only getting the yardages in chunks. Not a consistent offense for sure, which is what I'm sure they would like to be at this stage of the game. So as both teams huddle up and get ready for this second quarter, I'll remind you once again, as I did in the beginning of the game, only 14 points in the first quarter all season for Trinity. Not known for their hot starts. We're going to take a look at this beautiful Messick throw and the catch and run by Peyton Tuggle. Certainly one of the best two plays of the game so far, both coming in the passing game for the Tigers. Messick's doing a little bit more work on the other one. Of course, that was the Stewart catch way down the field in double coverage. So we'll see if they go to the passing game a little bit more as this game goes on. Only five attempts for Messix, as opposed to seven on the ground for McDowell and two on the ground for Jay Foster. Looks like he will throw this one out of the shotgun formation, though, and he's looking left. Didn't have his man, though, needs to go if he's going to get out of the pocket, and unfortunately he doesn't. And once again, number 40, Miles Myers, blowing up that play. So you see Tuggle coming to that right side, looking to draw attention, but he doesn't, and so that leaves the left side of the field out, and Messick's needed to make the decision to leave the pocket a little bit sooner than he did. Unfortunately, he will get sacked, and this will bring up a fourth and long field goal attempt by number 25, Jonathan Reyes. And this kick is up. It looks like it might be good, and it is. So Trinity will get some points. This kick had a little bit of hook on it, but not a bad one by any means. And it sneaks through the uprights pretty well. So now only a four-point game for Trinity, and the offense finally on the board. As we take a look at the referees discussing something on that sideline, and also the Tigers prepping for the kickoff. Brigham and Southern has had a bit of a difficult time moving the ball these past two drives. Getting small bits of yardage, but then ultimately stalling out. Trinity's defense does have a tendency to be a little bit bent, but don't break at times, which of course is difficult when you give the other offense such good field position on the opening drive, but as we've seen, successful on the other two. Reyes will line up for his first kickoff of the day, and Birmingham and Southern will return theirs. Coming from the left to the right, this one a pretty good kick down the center of the field. Tigers upfield well, and it looks like they're going to bring him down right around the 20. Decent return there by Robert Shufford, of course. Shifty on the field no matter where he is, and he makes this move right here that almost gets him a little bit of space, breaking off the tackle by number 21, Griffin Lay. Thankfully, the Tigers able to 
wrap it up. So the offense for Birmingham Southern, once again, coming out in the four wide shotgun formation, Shufford to the right of the quarterback, Oaks. And the way everyone is lined up, you would almost expect a run here on this first down, trying to get some yardage, and we are going to get flags here for delay of game, I believe. And that is indeed what is going to happen. Oaks couldn't get the snap off quick enough. Not paying attention to the play clock. And that will move this Birmingham Southern offense back. Looked like they were going to fake a handoff there before the play clock went out. Or perhaps Oaks just realized the flag was coming out before he completed the handoff. So not a lot of information there for the Tiger defense. This time they do hand it off. And Shufford has no room to run. Wrapped up very well by Matthew Willis. And they will gain nothing on the play. And this is the cutback that they've run a couple of times in this game, neither time to great effect. And that is a beautiful play by Matthew Willis, just shrugging off his blocker and falling into the running back. One tight end now for Birmingham Southern, but Oaks is looking long, and he might have a man coming back short. He does. So we'll gain a couple of yards on that play. It was Cole Merrill catching that one. You can see he's looking that way the entire time, tries to look down the field, but then comes back to his option. And that route was supposed to break it around the 30-yard line, but just kind of continued all the way to the sideline. Shufford now going to split out wide for the Panther offense. And this will be a lot of receiving options for Oaks. We'll see if he can make the most of it. Tiger defense seems to know what it's doing, though. And it's going to be a blitz. Oh, and a beautiful throw there by Oaks to number 25. DJ Cook saw the blitz coming all the way. You can see off of this left side, number 45, Robert Cooney, looking like he's going to be a pass defender and then streaking through. Oaks sees it right away, goes to his option in the middle. Cooney had left. So we'll get Oaks in the shotgun once again. A new set of downs for the Panthers. He looks left, throws left, and this one is almost picked off by Cooney. They can't quite get to it, although it will be a beautiful pass defense. This short passing concept that we've seen several times from the Panthers, the same route breaking for all three receivers. And Oaks just supposed to pick the defender who has dealt with it worst. Thankfully for the Tigers, no one dealt with it badly there. Oaks once again in the shotgun. To his left is C. He looks long left, and he has a man if he can make the catch, and he can. And that is probably the best play for this Birmingham Southern offense so far. Look at it drop right in the bucket there for Wells Smith. And now looking punchy once again. Although like we mentioned, Tiger defense has a tendency to be a bit bend to don't break sort of defense. Although this is a little bit dangerous for them, they will eventually deal with it. The screen for Cole Merrill there. Off of the fake handoff to C. Blocked well. And eventually handled out of bounds. After a gain of a couple, we have a player down for the Tigers. It's number 98, Michael Inko. And it looks like he has hurt that right thumb. Looks to be what he's grabbing at least. Some sort of right arm injury as he holds it to his chest. So that is an unfortunate loss for the Tigers if it is one. We'll see if Birmingham Southern choose to attack up the middle now. Shufford once again to the right of the quarterback in the shotgun. 
Three receivers to his right. It is going to be a run to Shufford right up the middle, and he has some room. That's going to be another first down. And he just bursts through that tiny little hole, gets himself some yards. And that's exactly why he's so dangerous. He has that ability to just shift through those holes. You see that all the time from the best of running backs. The ability to make yourself small, sneak through what your offensive line gives you. This one is going to be a pass to the right side, almost sacked from the back, but it is going to be completed to Cole Merrill. Tackle made out of bounds by Mies Field. And then look at this blind side rush. Almost gets there in time, but doesn't quite. And Merrill able to make the play. Not a new set of downs quite yet, though, for the Panthers. Oaks will have trips to his left. Schufer to his left as well. Out of the shotgun. And I believe that's number 18 to his right, Buddy Dowd. He is going to look left and then right to Buddy Dowd. This one up in the air, and it's intercepted by the Tigers. So an odd play there, resulting in the best possible outcome for the Tigers. Look as he goes right and then decides to throw at the last minute. Buddy Dowd isn't ready for it. We mentioned him. And then the pick. Absolutely beautiful, Kale Ridge. Not usually on that side of the field, out that wide, but just in the right position to make the play. We saw earlier in the drive that tipped pass almost resulted in interception. This one a little bit more dangerous. We have a player down on the field, it looks like, for Birmingham Southern. Can't get a number on it. Seventy-four. Spencer Schofield standing up and attempting to walk off under his own power, which is always good to see. I believe he may have been the player whose helmet was knocked off during the course of that play as he attempted to make a tackle. And we'll take another look at it right here. And I, no, it wasn't so just hit awkwardly, it looks like. We certainly hope that he's okay. Never want to see any player get injured. Even though it is a dangerous game, never like to see that happen. So, Tiger offense will be setting up inside its own 20 on the 15-yard line. We have this pistol formation once again for the Tigers. This is going to be a handoff and streaking through the middle. Tons of room to run. Might have it all the way down to the 40. And he does and then some. What a beautiful run by Charles Davis there and found himself in oodles of space. Look at this. No one around him. Gets down to the 40. Could have cut it back inside there but just decides to go for pure yardage. Villejoie has nothing to do but just make the desperation tackle. And all of a sudden, Tigers once again get a big chunk of yardage. We'll see if they can handle it a little bit better on this side of the field than they have in past. Davis behind once again. This is going to be fake to him. Messick's looking long. Hit as he throws. This one is going to be affected by that hit. from our angle didn't look like it was too far off until it hit the ground. But you can see hit as he throws, not able to complete his motion all the way and that one spiraling away from Stewart who looked like he might have been open on the play. And that could have been the first Tiger touchdown of the afternoon. Tigers have had success out of this pseudo pistol formation 
with Garrison Meeks in front of the quarterback. They're going to use it once again, this time out to the wide receiver. Stewart, Stewart breaks a tackle, breaks another tackle, now streaking down the right side of the field. He's got a first down. And look at him go. Carter Stewart breaking two tackles here, usually known for his speed, but right here known for his toughness, takes two hits. And then has to run out of bounds to avoid Villejoie. So the Tigers now threatening inside the 25-yard line. We'll see if they can seal the deal. They're often better in the second quarter than they are at the beginning and ends of games as they get into the flow of things and things haven't quite tightened up yet. This one a pass. Messick's looks left. Finds Stewart down the center of the field. And that is going to be inside the 10-yard line for the Tigers. Looks like the referee's going to mark it at the 7-yard line. Take a look at this one once again. Messick's looking left the whole time, knows exactly where he's going, and Stewart so speedy. He can find those little bits of space on the slant routes. And if you don't know where he is at the start of the play, you better find him because there's a good chance he could do something special every play. Once again, out of the pistol. This snap is very bad. Messick needs to fall on it, and he does. And that could have been very dangerous for the Tigers and heartbreaking even. This is going to be second down and goal. And Messix had a little trouble finding that one. Eventually does fall on it, but like I said, could have been a heartbreaker for the Tigers. So now second and goal, 16 yards to go. Seems like it's touchdown or bust for the offense at this point. Charles Davis, another carry. He's got room once again. Spin, yep, spun down right back to what was the original line of scrimmage, the seven-yard line. And watch the burst he has there, the cutback move, and spun down at the seven-yard line. My view was blocked just a little bit. I just managed to catch the end of that play, and I'm glad I did. see what the Tigers choose to do here. Davis has looked like he may be the favorite option going forward. Stewart making a motion out to the left. Messick looks left, has pressure, goes up the center, throws, and I, I think that's a touchdown. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I thought he was past the line of scrimmage, but Messick's aware of where he was, just gets it off, and Tommy Levine takes it away from the defender, and that's a touchdown. <laughs> so there you go. Beautiful play there by the Tigers, and Messick once again showing that every once in a while he can pull a trick out of the bag. Kick is up and is good for the extra point. It's 125 yards through the air for Messick's today. And the one touchdown. Look at how quick the release was on that pass. And then the strength of Levine to hang on to it. That is something special. And every once in a while you see it from these Tigers. And you wonder what they could do with just a little bit more consistency. We're going to take a look at the Charles Davis run. No, we're going to take a look at the Stewart pass that set up that touchdown catch. That was another great play by Messix. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe he has more yards in this game than he did all game against Millsaps, of course. That was a difficult game to get anything going in just because of the conditions. But I'm sure that he is glad to be back in a little bit of form. Here comes the kickoff, and this is a good kickoff once again to the center of the field. Shuford taking it, and he's going to break out to his left where he is covered. And once again, the Panthers will start their drive at about the 20. If you take a look at the center of the field for him, he has blockers, and it looks like he might just have a lane right there, but he chooses to go left. 
the Tiger right, which was well covered. So perhaps a bit fortunate for Tiger special teams. And now Oaks will start his drive with three men to his right. And it looks like C in the backfield. Oaks is going to hand it off to C. It's that cutback concept, and he's going to get a couple. Referee noting that number 67 on the offense got his helmet knocked off and therefore will be out for one play. And there it is at the middle of your screen, just behind C. Once again, setting up in the shotgun. Spread concept, moving left is Oaks, looking long, goes short instead, and that was Wells Smith, who had a little bit of room in front of him if he could find it. But he did end up unable to stop his momentum. Just a little touch pass there, and you can see Wells realizing at the end of that one that he had a chance to get some more yards if he had been able to stop his momentum. Looks like Oaks may have led him just a bit too much. Late substitution for the Panthers, moving a tight end instead of the wide receiver. And I believe that should be a flag on the Tigers as they had too many men on the field, but it doesn't look like any of the referees caught it. Either way, it's going to be a first down for the Panther offense. You can see that man running down off the bottom of your screen. Play already starts, and then C goes up the middle. And he will get the first down. Oaks now, once again, in 11 personnel, gives it off to C this time. He's got some room to run, and that one is dealt with, but not after a gain of about eight. And C with running room really just has to go in a straight line. Nothing special by him, but some special work by his blockers for certain. Back to the live action. Oaks now hands it off to Shuford. Again, the cutback concept. This time he breaks through the middle. And that is just a pure effort play as they gain another first down. I believe they are going to be past the 50-yard line by about two yards as you see him fall down. Tiger defense, again, we mentioned it before, bend but don't break seems to be the philosophy at times as Oaks drops back off of the fake and he's got his man. Beautiful diving catch. My goodness. Well, Smith there, that is a heck of a play as the fake handoff and then Oaks, the pass off of his back foot and a diving catch by Wells Smith, who kind of got this drive started. Tigers hoping to tighten up here in the red zone. Oaks looking left, throwing left, and that is Cole Merrill on that screen concept. Once again, almost gets into the end zone. Looks like he might have been stopped on the one inch line, if I have my eyes correctly. No, that's a different referee, you can see. Looks like he stepped out of bounds just about at the five. And Oaks now the snap out of the pistol. Going to give it to C, and I believe he's in. And he is. So 14 to 10. Panthers take the lead back in this one, and stretch the lead to four once again. See that little jump cut gets him over the initial line of the Tigers defense and he just about breaks the plane there for the touchdown. So once again Ryder Andrews chance at this extra point attempt. Last one was pretty low. See if the Tigers have a chance to block it. 
And this one much better. Solidly through the uprights. And in fact, a beautiful kick. Once again, reminding you that we are at Alamo Stadium because this is what the Trinity Field looks like. Absolutely destroyed in that last game. And playing on skates were all the players. So, a little nicer to be on the artificial turf for now. And a little bit more elbow room for the fans. So I think it's a win-win all around. Ryder Andrews to take this kickoff once again. Looking for the ball. The official will give it to him. It'd be nice of him. And they have a little chat. So now we'll get set for the kickoff after a small delay. Typical returners back for the Tigers, Edmondson and Stewart. One left, one right. This one looks like it's going to go to Edmondson. This is the longest kick of the night by far. Goes into the end zone for a touchback. And that one was driven. Sort of a low kickoff, but really effective. As you see, Edmondson backing up for that one, realizing it's going to go in the end zone and taking the knee there. Tiger offense will look to respond. First down and 10 on the 25. As per the rules. Messick will start this drive in this pseudo pistol formation, although McDowell looks like he's going to take it and spins off one tackler, gets a couple. McDowell not finding the holes so far in this game as he so often does. Looks like one might have opened here in the middle of the line and he had a cutback lane, decided against it. And at least gets a couple out of it, but... You look for some explosive runs from him every once in a while and he's not had one yet in this game. And he might have one here if he can find the lane, but again, he can't. And he only gets one out of it. Or maybe two if we're being generous. So it's going to be third and seven. Maybe third down and six, depending on which yard line you believe that ball is on. Looks like that is going to be Charles Davis in the backfield for the Tigers. Messick's looking long, looking left, has his man. Beautiful catch. What a catch by Cash Crane. And this pass, uh, if I may take the opportunity, was on the money. Look at that. So the chunk yardage coming in once again for the Tigers. And I imagine I'll probably be beating everyone over the head with that line for the rest of the game. This one, a handoff to the right, got some running room, and a flag comes out. Tackled hard at about the 36, maybe a 37. Looks like this could have been holding on... Yeah, I believe that's going to be holding on number 74, Brady Blanton. Excuse me, it is not going to be on the Tigers. So I must have missed whatever the penalty was. But I'm sure the Tigers will happily take their steps forward. Once again, in the pistol is Messix. Has Davis behind him, hands it off to him. He's got the speed to get around on the outside, but probably 
Just didn't have anywhere to go there. Charles Davis breaking left, and that offensive line cannot hold the edge for him. So unfortunately, this is going to be second and long. Second down and 16 from the 26-yard line. Messick fakes the handoff, looks left once again, this time to the center of the field. He's got his man in 10. And who else? Tommy Levine once again finds his way into the end zone. And all of a sudden, the Tiger offense is alive. He's looking at him the whole way. He knows who he's going to, and Levine is there for him. Splits the defense right up the seams. And there you have it. See, kids? Six points. Just as easy as that. This could be you one day. Reyes will take the kick once again. This one up and good. So the kicking game not having much impact on this one so far. And a three-point lead once again for the Tigers. And look at this pass. Beautiful, just over the shoulder. And that looked easy. So a minute and two left in this half. Panthers will have to go fast if they want to flip the score on this one once again, or at least tie it. Certainly have the capacity to do so if they lean on the passing game a little bit more. A lot of their routes tend to be out-breaking rather than in-breaking, so they often find themselves right next to the sideline. And they would be able to stop the clock with that. Probably have the opportunity for three or four plays, depending. Although they could, of course, just decide to send it to the half as they will receive the kick to start the second half. Here's the kick they're receiving right now, though. This one a bit short. Taken at the 12. And this one is going to be broken inside. A spin move, beautiful, but eventually tackled very well by... Jesse Garcia. And that was a change on the kickoff returner. Tavion Fleming taking this one instead of Shuford. And a good spin off the first tackle, but Tiger defense still in pursuit. Also have to give credit to number 13 Barnett of the Tigers for helping out with that one. A team effort, as all things are. Oaks with C behind him. Looks like two tight ends on the play for him, so in 21 personnel. And he is going to give it off to see. Very odd play design there. Although it could have just been miscommunication. Birmingham's number 60 lost his helmet. You can see that right there. And that was very odd. Almost looked like one of those plays where the quarterback goes to hand it off to the opposite side the running back is coming, but I'm not sure I've ever seen a play like that. Quarterback and running back both rolling out a bit. And Oaks with a very delayed handoff to the running back. Not that it got him anywhere, but I'm interested. And we are going to have a timeout here taken. at the 48 second mark. And we are gonna take, I believe, another look at this Messick's touchdown. I mean, you can't see it enough, can you? Perfection on every end. The fake draws the defense in just perfectly. Levine is able to streak up the seam. And the pass is about as good as you could want it. Messick's, we mentioned his statistics earlier in the game. He's now 8 for 11, 182 yards and two touchdowns. And he's got 12 yards on the ground to boot. Chris Stewart, the beneficiary of most of those yards, although Levine has the two touchdowns, so they're about even on the day.
We'll see if Birmingham Southern go to ground once again and show less interest. This one, the handoff to C once again and straight up the middle. And it looks like they may just be trying to run this one out to the end. Although this is... I believe going to be another timeout. And it will be. So the Tigers perhaps thinking they could get the ball back if they stop this drive quick enough. And that's one thing you have to consider if you're Birmingham Southern. Is that if you are going to throw away this drive, you have to realize that you cannot run the clock down that far unless you're going to do some very long developing plays. And usually those are passing plays, which if it's an incompletion, will stop the clock. So a lot of things to balance here for this Panther coaching staff. And we'll see what direction they choose to go to in just a second here as Oaks lining up once again in the pistol. In 11 personnel, one tight end, one running back, two to his left, one to his right. Surveys the field a bit. Checking with everyone to make sure they're on the same page. Here's the snap, and this one is going to be a fake to see. This one is deep down the field. If he can catch it, it'll be great, but it's broken up. A lot of contact between the players there, but no flag down. And that is going to be drive over, I think, for the Panthers. Oaks put everything he had into that one. And a beautiful job of defending there by Kadarius Lee. And Kadarius actually smart there. To be looking back for the ball so early as he had to know that the pass was coming downfield. Kick is off, and it's the best one so far, although it will just roll down the field once again. Still not a punt return for the Tiger defense. You can see this one comes off with a nice spiral. And almost looks like a pass out there. Hits the ground, bounces forward a bit, and not the best field position for the Tigers, but they'll have a shot at this one if they want it. 26 seconds to work with. And if you go really quick, you can make that into several plays. Messick's probably looking for Levine Short and Stewart Long on a play like this. Levine on the bottom of your screen. He'll probably be the safety option, some sort of comeback route to the out. Although this is going to be a handoff to McDowell, and he is through to the 50-yard line. And they're going to go quickly here. Looks like they're going to spike it. As we take a look at the replay, Messick has spiked the ball as you take a look at this one. And that is what you are looking to see from Evan McDowell and what we had been missing from him so far. He will come off the field, get some fresh legs out there in the form of Charles Davis, who has been perhaps the most effective. Well, I say perhaps. He's got 56 yards on four carries. He's been the most effective rusher for the Tigers on the day, at least. Messick will have two receivers to each side. And he will hand this one off once again to Davis. And another really good run. This one out to the 10-yard line. They're going to call it a first down. And Davis, just shifty enough and just speedy enough to get through that, keeps his legs churning, gets himself the first down. And head coach Jeremy Urban is going to take a second to discuss with his quarterback, Wyatt Messix. Messix running back onto the field after that. Only 10 seconds left on the clock here for the Tigers. And Messix 
Looking deep, looking left. Stewart's there if it's good. Oh, he dropped it. May have been a little bit of interference from the defensive back, but that looked like it was in his hands. And I thought Messick had his third touchdown. Saw him, let it rip. We'll see if the defender gets in here just a little bit, and he may have just been able to pull Stewart's arms away from the ball. Is what I believe happened. But that could have been it. And that would have been a devastating strike for the Panthers. Who again had a chance to make a short drive earlier on in the game. At about the one minute mark. And basically chose not to do so. Since they were getting the ball back in the second half. And if Trinity gets anything here, you have to imagine the coaching staff for the Panthers will be kicking themselves, but it will only be one chance left. So as the Tigers on the bottom of your screen converse, this will almost certainly be a pass. Davis will be out there. Stewart will be out there. Tommy Levine at the top of your screen. And Stewart in that little trips formation. Composed of Cash Crane and Matthew Thompson. Messix takes the snap and goes short to Stewart. And they're probably looking for a little bit better than that, but that'll be the end of the first half. So, your Trinity Tigers 17, Birmingham Southern College Panthers 14, and after a shaky start, the Tigers have managed to make a comeback and take the lead in this one. We're going to step out for a bit of halftime. I'll see you at the beginning of the first half for the Tiger Network. I'm Sam McWhorter. Right before we go, though, we're going to take one more look at perhaps the biggest play of the game so far, the interception. That gave the Tigers the field position when the Panthers looked like they may have been threatening to extend their lead. I'll see you on the other end of halftime. For now, take a rest. This is going to be an exciting second half.
this Trinity University football contest. I'm joined now by Taylor Stakes, my name is Sam Porter. Gonna have the kickoff here in just a second, but we'll have some replays from the first half ready for you. Yeah, Sam, let's take a look at that first touchdown for the Tigers. And, uh, you know, it's was, it was pretty uh, interesting, you know, just a straight great pass and uh, barely got uh, got behind that, that line of scrimmage there. Yeah, not much margin for error there. Decent return there for the Panthers. So Sam, do you like being in the air-conditioned booth? Yeah, it's nice. Uh, get to sit back and relax a little bit more. I think no one is happier than I am that we are in this Alamo Stadium press booth. As we take a look at first play for the Panther offense, Schufert's going to take it on this left side. He's got room. He's going to be tackled, though. Left side. What are you looking for in the second half from the Panther offense? You know, I think they've run the ball really well. I think uh, they've executed uh, exceptionally well in the first half. I think they just haven't gotten the job done at getting in the end zone. I think they need to really execute on their passes. I mean, we saw that one great pass they had. That was, you know, the wide receiver just laid out for the ball. But I think they really need to can stay with, stick with the run. I mean, they've gotten the Tigers a few times uh, for some decent yardage. But I think they've just got to execute and uh, and finish the, their drives. They're not really finishing the drives, even though they're, they're, they're doing a great job. Yeah, certainly true. And perhaps part of that, the Tiger defense, their tendency to give up yards but not touchdowns. This play by Robert Schuford, indicative of that. Not great tackling there by the Tigers, but he gets a couple of yards. Yes, Sam, you know, one thing I wonder is if the turf is having an effect on the uh, Trinity players. You know, one thing about having home field advantage is, is being able to play on that, that grass field and, and playing on this turf field here at Alamo Stadium. I'm just wondering if it has some sort of effect on how the Tigers are playing versus how, you know, Birmingham Southern, who may be more accustomed to playing on, on turf. Yeah, certainly could be a factor here as we go forward. Obviously, your cuts on turf are a little bit different just because when you plant, you usually expect a little bit of give out of a grass field so you can plant a little bit harder. It benefits the lighter players to play on turf. Not as much low, and it looked like the ball came out there, and I believe it's recovered by the Tigers. The Tigers do have it. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, that goes back to what we were just talking about. They just aren't, aren't really finishing their drives. I mean, that's a huge turnover right there in, in their own territory for the Tigers. And I think, as we've seen, the Tiger offense is really going to have to capitalize here and just, you know, get a score here. But even if they don't, I think the momentum is really all in the Tigers' favor at this point. Yeah, I think you're right. Messick's looking to his left here. Going to go short to Stewart, and he's going to have a couple wrapped up nicely by number two, DJ Albright. Again. One thing I love about Messick is his ability to stand in the pocket or get out of the pocket if he needs to. I mean, he's an excellent runner, but he also can, he can throw the ball really, really well. I think that's something that the Tigers have really needed for a while, and I think Messick brings them that, that dual option for the quarterback. Yeah, it's something they should perhaps lean into a little bit more going forward. And this one's going to be a handoff into the center. Just a scrum there. And someone's helmet's going to come off. I think that's going to be 78. Gabe Swift. And he will. He'll have to come off the field for at least one play. Third down and one. Again, and straight up the middle. 
trying to get the first down at this point. I do not believe that they have it, though. So this is going to go to fourth down. And this is going to be fourth down and one for the Tigers. They are going to go for it. We'll see what they choose to do. They've gone straight up the middle twice now. And they could do the same here. They're in that pistol fullback formation. This is going to be a timeout taken by head coach Jeremy Urban, though. And he will try and rethink that. Looks like they were trying to catch them quickly. This is the first charge timeout for Trinity of the half. What I just heard over the loudspeakers there. That looked like, as I was saying, Trinity trying to catch the defense off guard there. Maybe a quick snap. And perhaps that would have been a first down had. Interesting thing here will be whether they choose to go for it once again or whether they're going to send out the kicking team, but the kicking team moves back to the sidelines, so this is going to be the offense, good or bad. They're going with it. Garrison Meeks on the field. Looks like they could be going into that pistol formation once again. Yeah, I'm surprised that... Uh Coach Urban didn't elect to do a fake punt. He loves to uh, execute those fake punts here on fourth and one. That's certainly a favorite of his. Messick's calling for the snap. And it's going to be to McDowell. Once again, he's got it out on the left side. Just about gets inside the 10 yard line. Yeah, you'll see here on the replay the offensive line just does a great job getting separation for McDowell to get into that second line of defense there. Dow's strength is just his ability to get off the line with his speed. Certainly has that quick burst acceleration athleticism that head coaches tend to covet. Players have had a lot of success out of this formation or several variations of it, just generally when Garrison Meeks is leading the blocking. We'll see if they go towards him again. McDowell running across now, and he will go that side. He's got a lot of room if he cuts back, and he could make it. He's going to call him down just short. Yeah, he's just short of that, uh, that goal line there. His knee touchdown. We'll see here on the replay where his knee touched down, but I think it was just short. But great, great job extending the ball. I don't know. That's close. Yeah, that is certainly a judgment call, and they've got him. I think on the, just behind the one yard line, this is one of those plays you'd like to say was just inches away from the goal line, not a yard out. Messick calling for it in this pseudo pistol. Once again, McDowell, he's done. Easy score for the running back, McDowell. He's an exciting player to watch and I think he deserved that touchdown there and just walked right in the end zone untouched. Yeah, and once he gets it going, he tends to have a great game going forward. And I do believe that he has just eclipsed 64 yards on the ground, and he needed just 63 this game to become the 16th Tiger player ever to reach 1,500 rushing yards in a career. So congratulations to Evan McDowell as the kick goes up and is in. Um, heck of an achievement for any player at Trinity University put themselves on those record books that were at the top of the game. They've done. Take a look at this touchdown run one more time. Taylor walking through it. Yeah, you're just going to see that Evan McDowell just grabbed the ball and run it in untouched. I mean, it's a great job by the offensive line. You see Joel Holmes there just get some leverage on his, you know, uh, opponent there on the defensive line. I think that's why, you know, he one of the best offensive linemen that Trinity has right now. Just the ability to, to really open up his plays for his, for his offense. Yeah, he's certainly able to get that initial push on the offensive line. That's often so important, especially in deciding those goal line runs. That first phase of contact. Really there are several phases of contact for the offensive line, depending on what kind of play it's in. And that first phase is really the only one that matters at the goal line. And he is absolutely brilliant. So we'll 
see the second kickoff of the half for Trinity. This one in a little bit better of a position, 10 game, or 10 point lead, excuse me. The returner is once again not Shuford after he had a couple of shaky returns in the beginning of the first half. He's got some room, beautiful spin move, gets all the way out to the 28. Yeah, and he just was able to get open by a missed tackle by a Tiger. Let's see who that was. I think, you know, he almost had him locked up at the 15. Ooh, just a, a great juke at the last second to get away. Play. Of course, made the tackle on a similar play earlier on in the first half. So the Panther offense is going to trot out once again. They're going to run that tight trips on the right side. 21 personnel for them. Two tight ends, one running back. Pokes in the shotgun. Going to hand it off to Shuford. Shuford bouncing this one outside and cuts in for a couple more yards. It's going to be a gain of about six, I believe. And if you're just joining us here on the Tiger Network, uh, this is not our home field and not our normal uh, Brad broadcast spot. We're over here across the literally across the street at Alamo Stadium. For upper campus at Trinity, Alamo Stadium is actually closer to campus than the Tiger Stadium down at lower campus. But we do wish we were at home. I know the football team definitely does. But we are very thankful for our hosts, Alamo Stadium and San Antonio Independent School District for putting us up and letting us uh, borrow their facility while our field dry tries to dry out, but unfortunately it keeps raining here at San Antonio. Certainly been a rainy month for Trinity. But sun out a bit more than usual today. Some very nice conditions. Just came in. Really great showers. Oaks is going to hand this one off to Shuford, who bursts up the middle but doesn't find any room. They may have gotten two on that play, I'm not sure. And it looks like that's great. Referee will call it. That was just a great play by the Tiger defensive line there to just block all those holes. Aaron Hale blowing up his blocker. Doing a beautiful job, and that will stall out the Panther offense once again. Taylor, like you were mentioning, not doing a great job of finishing their drives, even though they managed to get some good momentum at the start of it. Yeah, they just get great, great yardage at the beginning of the play and then just kind of kind of stall out. This one. Great punt. Pretty good. One of the best punts of the day so far, of course. Oh, well, let's see where they spot it. <laughs> They're going to spot it a little higher up than I thought it went out, but still not bad. Of course, we had those two shaky punts up top for Ryder Andrews, although he seems to have, for the most part, turned things around. Just inside the 25 for the Tigers, of course, they'll be starting on the 25 in terms of touch back on the kickoff, so certainly not a place that they are unaccustomed to starting a drive from. Out on the field, though, joining quarterback Wyatt Messick's, it's not going to be Evan McDowell. It's going to be Charles Davis once again in that backfield. So they're in a bit of a timeshare right now after Davis showed off his skills earlier on in the game, but he's going to be wrapped up here, nowhere for him to go. I didn't see a cutback lane. I could have missed it, but it looked like that was not on the running back table. No, it just looked like that play was blown up in the very beginning. You can see right there, that was just a great defensive play call there to bring those two. Really just stack the box there. They knew that it was going to be a run play, and I think, I think that was just a good defensive play. Yeah, beautiful defensive play from them. A couple of blockers missing their blocks as well all contributing to a loss of about three. Messick's going to try and make it up here. He's looking left. He might have his man. Tommy Levine has to go high, but he gets up for it. We have his flag down. Would have been for a push-off. Tommy might get called for that push-off there. Let's see what happens here on the replay. Hopefully, oh, I actually couldn't, his mic on. couldn't see it there. But there was a lot of separation there. Yeah, perhaps a little bit more than 
would have gotten just from his route running. Let's hope the referee turns on his mic here so we can hear him. Yep, that's what it's going to be. Good call, Taylor. And that is a rough penalty because it's half the distance to the goal, so the Tigers are going to move well back into their own territory. And this is going to be second and very long. Yeah, let's take a look at it again. I mean, oh. that's that's not a very good call at all. I don't think uh, I don't think there was clear pass interference there. I think Levine just stopped and. Uh, yeah, calling the guy for good route running, it seems. Putting the defender on skates. Gonna try and get some yardage back with Messix. He takes it on the option, gets a couple, but ultimately does not have the room to make anything else happen, although it was a pretty good play design. You see Charles Davis look like he's getting it. That'll bring us up to third and 19, which unless the Tigers are okay with settling for a punt, this is going to have to be a pass here. Essex has three to his left. He is going to fake a handoff, run pass option. He's out of the pocket. He has a man downfield. If he can find him, oh, he just couldn't. But he had Stewart running for a couple of seconds there, and then Stewart had to slow down or he was going to go out of bounds. But the run pass option gets blown up. Messick, beautiful job of staying out, and unfortunately just couldn't find him. He saw Messick streaking towards the center of the field just at the end of that play. Yeah, I don't think Messick's really had anybody open downfield either. I think that was a really wise decision to get rid of the ball. Rather than forcing something, I think uh, just get rid of the ball and hope that your special teams can flip the field for you. Yeah, certainly not the worst case scenario for him. And we get a ruling there from the referee. Take a look at that after this punt. Yeah, we got a uh, notification that he was past the line of scrimmage when he released that ball. And I got to be honest with you, I didn't see that at all. If anything, it looked like he was closer to the line of scrimmage on that touchdown pass than he was there. Either way, though, it was going to be a punt for this Tiger offense. This one is going to be returned. Streaking towards the left side. Finds a little room on the sideline, but not much. Maybe getting just past the 50-yard line on the punt from TJ Renzeski. And let's take a look at this one, Taylor. And you can see right there at the 15, he is beyond it. Unfortunate penalty, but a good uh, call by the official. So far, fakes the handoff, looks long, doesn't have a man, and that is far overthrown. Oaks has been looking a bit scattershot here in this second half, Taylor. Yeah, I think uh, I think if his receiver was about three feet taller, that might have been a complete pass, but just threw way over his head there. He just forgot he wasn't throwing <laughs> the shack. He thought and, he was throwing the shack. And, and, you know, he was open. That would have been an easy first down for them. Yeah, unfortunate. Paul Merrill probably could have added to his statistics as well. I'm sure he would have liked that. Trevor Oaks, again, trips to the right. 21 personnel handing it off to Schuford. And going to get about four, maybe five yards if he's lucky. And Tigers have done a really good job of stopping the run in the second half. I think that play right there just shows you that even though you got three yards, um, you know, that's something that they were doing really well in the first half was just being able to get in that second line of defense and Tigers have done a great job adjusting and stopping that. Yeah, they absolutely have, making sure not to give up anything longer than a four or five yard run at the maximum. And this is going to be another throw. Oaks looking, he's under pressure, steps up in the pocket. He's going to take off with this one. He might have room, and he will. So it ends up being a good decision for Trevor Oaks. 
Yeah, he had a lot of speed on that play to get away from the Tiger defenders. You know, I think uh, I think that was some great improvis improvisation to get the first down. Yeah, and some rare improvisation as he has only run, I believe it's four times this entire year for a total of 14 yards. So pulling that one out of the bottom of the barrel, getting it done. is going to be the handoff to Schufer, and he's going to lose the ball. It's loose. I'm going to say they have it. And it is a scrum, but the referee is going to come in with the call, and the Panthers are already walking off the field. There you have it. Let's see who got this hit. Oh, man, that ball just pops out flying. And with his own player being pushed into him by Aaron Hale, Hale has had a heck of a game in the second half. First, the blown up. I believe he was in on the first. Big loss of yardage for the Panthers earlier in this half, and now inadvertently causing a fumble. So two turnovers here for the Panthers in this second half. Once again, as you were mentioning, trouble finishing the drive. In the pseudo pistol once again, Messix. He's going to roll out this time on the bootleg. He has a man, and I think he got the catch. And I think he did too. Another flag down, though. We'll see who this is on. And Levine. Another great catch by Levine. Reminds me a lot of Larry Fitzgerald. Just gets open with great route running. His hands are so good. Able to catch most things thrown his way. And we could be looking at another bad call here. Let's take a look at it. If we can find the receiver on the bottom side, we can't, but Tommy Levine once again called for pass interference. And uh, Taylor, did you see anything on that one? Uh, I, you know, I don't I don't know if what where where Pushoff could have been, or what happened on that play? I think the ref may have saw Levine um, push off again, but like we, we saw in the first one, there was no contact at all, so who knows on that play. Unfortunately, we don't have that those angles to show you guys on the replay, because we are not in our normal broadcast location at Tiger Stadium here across the street at Allen Stadium. So we apologize for that, but we do have the best we can, and Tigers are trying to put forward the best they can as well. McDowell not getting much out of it, though. And this is going to be, again, a long second down. And it seems like we've seen this story again. Tigers going to be four wide here. McDowell to Messick's left. Messick's looking left, goes to McDowell on the swing pass, and he has a little bit of room. Might have just gotten four yards, maybe five out of that one. If the spot is generous. Good little swing pass there. Probably looking for a little bit more room out on that side. Looked like it could have developed into a wheel route as well if Massex had held onto the ball a little longer. I'm not sure if that would have been better or worse or indifferent. looking to build options into their offense a little bit more in the second half. Messick is flushed out of the pocket to his left. He has a man downfield. He finds him. Huge hit comes in, but I think he had the first down beforehand. What a catch. What a catch. Just a great play to be right there on the edge of that. And that is Austin Burtness, who I believe before this game only had Four catches on the season, so I believe that's his fifth, and it's a good one. Yeah, that's a that's a, that's a conversion the Tigers really needed there. Yeah, third and 16 to convert that is a great play. Essex once again showing some skills as this one is ooh, choked down is McDowell. Sometimes that's the only way you can bring him down when he gets that speed under his legs. It's tough to tough to bring him down when he's moving and shaking and. Got that speed going, so you got to wrap him up any way you can. A 
absolutely. Once he has a head of steam, it is tough to stop him. Really the best way to stop him is just to put the holes as small as possible. Sometimes that stunts him just a little bit, but either way, he is a difficult player to deal with for most defenses. Once again, out of the pistol for Messix. Down moves up a little closer to him, perhaps signaling a run. And it will be an option, so McDowell does not get it. Messick's brought down behind the line of scrimmage. Yeah, that's an interesting play call there. It looked like McDowell actually could have gotten in his second line there, but they they saw Messick's there keep the ball and just blew up the play. Yeah, and Messick's, again, still a sophomore, still gaining experience, so perhaps would have made a different read. He'd have better grasp of it, but... Yeah, you know, Messick's got to play, sit behind... Uh, Austin Grauer last year and watch how Grauer played, and I think that's really benefited his play this year. It has, although it didn't benefit him on that Definitely play. I just the offensive line let a man through. And Messick really couldn't go anywhere. He already had flushed himself from the pocket on the bootleg, and no one able to hold the line. Joel Holmes just looking for somebody, anybody to block there. Couldn't find somebody. And that'll result in a punt after the great third down conversion for the Tigers. Yeah, Sam, I saw Messick's kind of limping off the field there after that last play, so we'll have to watch that and see if it kind of hinders his ability to play or even run the ball. Absolutely. Keep an eye on that going forward. This one fair caught at the 11-yard line by number 22, Tavion Fleming, who has been handling the return duties ever since she fell. Start of this broadcast, Trinity University, one touchdown in all fourth quarters this season. So their offense not exactly as prolific as it is in the rest of the game as things start to tighten up. Yeah, and this fourth quarter is going to be an interesting one for sure. Birmingham Southern's got a lot of points to make up, and it looks like they can do it. this snap, fakes the handoff to see, has tons of time, goes downfield, has the man, but overthrew him. And that's something we've been seeing from Oaks is that his passes have not been quite as pinpoint in this second half. Yeah, and he definitely had a man open there. Uh, you know, that, that could have been six points right there if, if that ball was on target. And he got the step, but just overthrew. And that's about the same separation you saw Stewart had earlier in the first half when Messick got him on the numbers. So certainly a makeable throw. C takes his hand off to the right and doesn't get anything. And it seems like at some point Birmingham Southern is going to have to rely on the pass a little bit more as number 92 comes off the field. His helmet was knocked off. So Campbell Miller will not be able to play this down. But as I was saying, it seems like Birmingham Southern at some point is going to have to go to the pass, and you just wonder how much they can rely on that, unless Oaks can get himself back under control. We know he has the talent. Does he have the composure? Gets a good pass there. Ooh, he almost lost the ball there. Yeah, that was a shaky moment there for Birmingham Southern, but they're going to be right up on... The first down line, you wonder, I think they're going to go for it. I wonder if they're going to actually measure it. It looks like they're not going to bring the chains out to measure it, just short. Yeah, but it looks like the offense is staying out on the field, so 
This is a very big moment for the Panther offense. Yeah, I think it's an interesting play call too to go for for here and deep in their opponent's territory. I think I think uh, deep in their own territory. Sorry, you know, it's a risky play call. They're only down ten, and it's there. You go. There's the timeout. He he wanted a measurement, I think. Yeah, unfortunately for him, didn't get it. As head coach Tony White calls for the timeout. Seemed like they didn't even try a hard count snap there either, which you usually see if you don't get the measurement, you usually see a hard count snap trying to draw the defense off sides, get the penalty, get the yardage. And it looks like now the punt team will come out. And it certainly will. Ryder Andrews will be back to give this one a go. And I think this is a good decision for Birmingham Southern. You know, you're only down 10 points and got the full fourth quarter left and um, you know now you got two timeouts but I think it's a good play call you know rely on your defense here get the ball back oh and dropped there and then hit hard as Stewart that could have been a risky moment Stewart is lucky to get that ball back there that just bounced right back into his hands yeah I mean look at this this could have gone any number of ways you know another pretty short punt here oh and if you're a Tiger fan, that is not something you were hoping to see. Unless you just needed a little spike in the heart rate to burn a couple of calories. Tigers are going to come out on the field with Charles Davis in the backfield. Evan McDowell's going to take a rest for at least a little bit. Garrison Meeks back on the field as well as they move to this pistol with the fullback just behind the tight end. Two receivers on either side. Charles Davis will get the ball. It'll be into the center of the defense and no gain there. Yeah, you know, this two-feature running back uh, for the Tigers offense is a really great thing to have. You know, it allows both of those those running backs to take a, take a breather in between plays. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why the running game has been so powerful for the Tigers. I think you're absolutely right. The ability to have fresh legs is always huge. Messick's now going to take the snap. Give it to Charles Davis. Davis has some room into the first down marker down at the 40. Thought he was going to be brought down two or three times throughout that run, but he just kept going. Yeah, and you'll see on this play, it's it's the offensive line for the Tigers. You see Joel Holmes right there just opening up a huge hole, just obliterating his man to get that running back into that second line of defense. As we get another call from the referee about a helmet coming off. Yeah, a lot of helmets have been flying off in this game. I'm not sure if it's because it's so humid here and you know, they're just slipping off the heads, but it seems like a, a lot of helmets. Maybe it's just a physical game. Could be. Either way, tighten your chin straps, fellas, as Charles Davis, another run, but again, no gain. We'll see if the next play is as successful as his comeback was last time out. This looked like it was a little bit better dealt with in the first phase by the Birmingham Southern defense. Harrison Meeks will come on the field, so that will signal a change in formation for the Tigers, as it has many times throughout this game. Davis in the shotgun. Next to Messix, gets the ball and another hole open for him. He looked like he cut it back in and he didn't need to. Yeah, I, I, I thought he had it on the outside. Could have gone for about 20 more yards there. Yeah, look at all the green he's going to have on the top of your screen here. And right there. Unfortunately, he just decided to cut it back in. Still, though, a pretty good gain. And third down and six here for the Tigers. Do you feel like this is a big moment here, Taylor? I think, you know, I think the Tigers have done a really good job of, of controlling the clock on this play. I think they do need to pick up the first down, though. I think really, really, ha really having control of the play clock is, play clock is very uh, beneficial for them, this drive. And there you go. There you have it. If he can get the first down. And it looks like the spot will give it to him. That was Matthew Thompson on that right side. Take a look at what kind of route he was running. Looked like just a little out route. 
Essex finds him. Yeah, and a makes great, a turn. great job of getting that first down. Yeah, he certainly could have been shot, stopped a line short, but he just managed to get it over. And your favorite fullback is back, Garrison Meeks, right in front of Essex. Davis just behind him. And this one is going to be another fake. Messick's looking long. He might have a man. Oh, no. That could have been an interception. Yeah, and I'm not sure that was needed there on first down. I guess they were just trying to go for the home run, but you're up by 10 points, and you're in you know, positive territory. I think, I think you've got to just stick with the run game. It's gotten you this far, and I think uh, you know having control of that, that clock is so important, especially this late in the game. It looked like he was expecting Stewart to break onto maybe a post route or something like that. It, either way, a miscommunication after that play call. Just want a quick throw. And again, not gaining any yardage. And not running that play clock, as you mentioned. And probably a good thing, too, because... That was number 42, Court Coley just lurking there. And if that pass had been on target, I think he would have picked it off. Four wide here for the Tigers. Messick's in the shotgun. Davis to his left. Davis is going to split out wide. He'll be the option. Looks for him, doesn't have him. Beautiful defensive play call there by the Panthers. Have to credit that. That was incredible. Yeah, and I actually thought that was going to be an easy pickup for a first down. He had a lot of wide receivers open, but I think the pocket just collapsed way too quick on him, and he just didn't have a chance to get the ball out. Yeah, and he looks for Charles Davis there on his left, but streaking in is number 35, Dylan Main. Yeah, and he had Matthew Thompson open too over there in the flat, and I think he just kind of missed him and kind of got rushed there at the end. And this is going to be a punt. It uh, looks like that one might have a little too much on it once again, although it bounces backwards. What a great punt. That is excellently done. And TJ Renizeski does it again. And that is exactly what you want to do there. I mean, you you pinned him right there on the two-yard line. That is a great, great punt. And now, really, it's just up to the Tiger defense to... To hold this Birmingham Southern offense with nine minutes and 13 seconds left. And back is this Panther offense. Once again, the three to the right. Oaks is going to look towards it. Didn't have anyone at first. Now he has a man. And that'll be number 18, Buddy Dowd, finally getting back into the action and back on the score sheet. Excuse me, the stat sheet. Interested to see what kind of formations they're running because generally out of this three-wide formation, it seems like they have a lot of pass plays, not a ton of run plays. And this is the same exact play to the other side, this time caught by number 13, Gintry Nice. Haven't seen much out of him this game, if at all. There you have it. Same play call, same side, different receiver. Yeah, and I think the Tigers are really just trying to prevent the home run play here, but at the same time, you've got to prevent them getting the first down and even getting out of bounds to stop the clock, you know, like that play right there. Yeah, and again, the same play. That is one of the first times I've ever seen a college offense run the exact same play three times in a row, just to a different side each time. Yeah, and they're going pretty quick. They're not really substituting or allowing the Tigers to substitute, and, it, and I think that's one of the reasons why the play is working for them. You know, I definitely think there should be some adjustment there from defense. And this time it is a different play, but a worse result, as that may be a gain of about one... Maybe if he fell forward, not much doing there off of the screen play in the same formation, though, so probably had the Tigers thinking it was the same play. Or at least that was the hope of the coaching staff. Yeah. 
Tiger, Tiger fans really showed up today. I'm surprised, you know, with the weather that was expecting it was expected to rain and moving from our home field over to here. You know, it's nice to see all these Tiger fans out here filling filling up the home side of Alamo Stadium. Absolutely. Shout out to them for coming out to the game. We always appreciated having some fans in the building. And that one thrown behind the receiver, and that could have been a flag. He he uh, he took a very vicious hit there. And again, that three wide to the top formation. Have not seen the Panthers run out of that all day, so it seems like you know what's coming, and the receiver certainly didn't. I'm not sure I'd be getting back up after that one. No, I think I'd just take a nap. Just right there on the turf, just for a bit. And he did pick up a penalty, unfortunately, roughing the passer. Which is if interesting because that was certainly felt like there could have been a flag on that play, but I didn't see anything in the backfield. Maybe you did, Taylor. Let's see if we can see it here on this replay. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a late hit, but it wasn't as egregious as the NFL. Clay Matthews last weekend. Yeah, that situation was unfortunate. Oaks is going to try and float this one out to his receiver after he was viciously pursued by three players. Yeah, and that's great defense right there by the by the Tigers there to put pressure on on the quarterback. I think they really just got in his face and kind of flushed him out and he wasn't able to really get his get his feet set and throw the ball to make it to his receiver and I think that's that's really the pressure that's needed. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right and we mentioned it on the last drive. Oaks has certainly shown the talent, but sometimes the composure is a little bit off for him. So if you can perhaps fluster him in the backfield, that's a good thing to do. And that is just going to be a little short swing pass. Robert Shuford, the sophomore out of McKenzie, Alabama. Yeah, and a big third down here for Birmingham Southern. One that they could be remembering for the rest of this game if it goes poorly. And one that the Tigers could be regretting if it goes well. So a lot on the line here. Only going two to the right now, so a little bit more of an option for Oaks, and he goes across the middle. If the player can streak across the field, he can. First down. Beautiful run there by Wells Smith. We haven't seen him used in that capacity yet. Just a little dig route, it looked like. Only a couple of yards out, and he just had the space to run all the way across the field diagonally and pick up his yards. Had to work hard for him, though. And it seems like Brandon Southern just going air raid at this point. Can't blame him. Oaks looking left. Doesn't have a man. Now he does. Great break there. I mean, that is a fantastic route from Cole Merrill. Yeah, I think sometimes that just comes down to a great play and a great, and a great throw. Great throw and catch and just had a open window that allowed him to get, get that first down there. And the break inside freed him up against the zone, which happens from time to time. Oaks now with three to his right. We mentioned that he hasn't passed to the left out of that formation all day either, and he goes to the right once again. And all of a sudden, the Panthers are going for a drive here, huh? Yeah, they're really knocking on the door of that end zone, and uh, I don't think that's what the Tigers wanted to do. You know, we had them, we had them pretty, uh, pretty dead rights third and ten back at the thirty, just four plays ago. And I think, I think that the Birmingham Southern offense is really, uh, is really rolling now. I think the de the Tiger defense can hold them, then at least hold them to three here. That would be the best, uh, best scenario. Yeah, although C has a little bit of room here, he's going to get. Maybe four looks like as the referee spots it. And indeed it will. Zach C getting the handoff to the inside here. Guards pulling. Yeah. Cut back lane. Yeah, and you see he just got that little hole right there that the offensive line allowed him. But 
But I think um, I think that was great work by the Tiger defense to, to make sure that he didn't get into that end zone there and get more yardage. Yeah, and he is wrapped up right at the line of scrimmage, although he does a great job of keeping his legs moving. Almost got a second effort around the outside, but the Tiger defender was there to meet him. And they're running some heavy guard pulling schemes here early, and there was C keeping his legs moving, but unable to bounce it to the outside as there was another player waiting for him. Oaks now in the pistol. Looks right, throws right, fade route. Could be danger. Just out of bounds. Yeah, and that was a great throw. It just wasn't on target. I mean, he had the he had the angle, but just overthrew him a little bit. And it's the second time we've seen that overthrown ball there. Yeah, great opportunity for a throw. And now it does look like they're going to try a field goal here that would bring the gap down pretty significantly as anytime you get within a touchdown you're threatening Ryder Andrews gonna have a good look at this one he's looked good on the extra points can he get this one through it's low again but it is good barely snuck in there it looked like that was gonna be a little wide to the left to me but we're up here in the up here in the press box at Alma Stadium. It's tough to see. Yeah, not the greatest view, but either way, it's going to be three points for Birmingham Southern, and they are right back in this game after a long drive. That was a five-minute drive, almost five and a half-minute drive, and they do not have time for another one of those. So. If nothing else, if you're a Tiger fan, you can take solace in the fact that, one, they didn't get the touchdown, and two, it took them a long time to get there. So perhaps the quick strike abilities of this Panther offense are not there. Yeah, and you know, it'll be interesting to see what Coach Urban draws up here for the offense. Uh, you know, with three minutes and 51 seconds left, leading by a touchdown, I think... Um, I think you've got a lot in your favor, but I also think you do need to make sure that you, you know, utilize that that clock and the ability to control the game. You've got a great, you've got a great run offense, and I think um, the ability to capitalize on that is going to be key here for the Tigers on this drive. Yeah, and I'd love to see a little bit creativity from the coaching staff as well. Definitely want to utilize the running game, but. You also might want to use it in perhaps a little bit more unconventional ways just because things get tight here in this last quarter. That is a squib kick, although Edmondson's going to pick it up. Doesn't have any room to work with, and he's going to get out to the 25. Yeah, and if you're just joining us here on the Tiger Network, there's about three minutes and 46 seconds left here in the, in the fourth quarter. Trinity Tigers versus... Birmingham Southern. Tigers were up by 10 to start the fourth quarter, but uh, we just witnessed a field goal by Birmingham Southern. And we are, of course, not at our home field. We are across the street at Alamo Stadium, letting our field dry out. We really wanted the players to be safe this week, make sure that uh, the field is absolutely safe, and coaching staff and university officials just weren't, weren't sure that it was going to be safe. And turf field certainly comes in handy for cases like that. McDowell gets a couple. Looks like a gain of four on the play for him. Just a straight run. And if you can do that with it every time, that would be quite nice. But we heard from end zone at the top of this broadcast, Jillian Caridi was talking a little bit about how perhaps the weakness of this Birmingham Southern team is their defense, specifically their run defense. So we'll see if that hurts them here. Three yards for McDowell. We'll see if her prediction comes true. Trinity leading right now. That would look good for them. Of course, you can catch end zone live 5 o'clock Wednesdays 
on live.trinity.edu, same place you're probably watching this broadcast, and on channel 14 if you're in San Antonio. Yeah, Sam, t talk to us a little bit about what Endzone is and kind of a little bit about the uniqueness of that program. Well, Endzone is a really unique program. Uh, it's one of Tiger TV's four student-run programs, and uh, it is our sports show on Wednesdays, talking all about pro sports, Trinity sports. McDowell gets wrapped up there, and that's going to bring it to fourth down. But Endzone talks a lot about what happened last week in Trinity sports, so if you missed anything, you can come to us, and I know for... Some viewers, it's a little difficult to get information on what happened if it was an away game, and it isn't on the Tiger Network. So we'll cover all of that on Wednesdays, and we'll also always take a look ahead and uh, tell you what's coming up for your Tiger teams. Another timeout taken. Yeah, Tiger TV really has got some great programming. Almost every day of the week, you'll have a, a show going on, and I think that's really cool that not only can you watch it on television in San Antonio, but you can also watch it wherever you world, thanks to the Tiger Network partnership to bring uh, live streaming to Tiger TV, live streaming those shows, and kind of showcasing all the different, uh, different entertainment options and news options that the talented Trinity students have through Tiger TV. Absolutely, and... Of course, they all have a lot of fun, and we hope everyone at home has a lot of fun watching us. And if you ever miss an episode, you can check it out on the Vimeo page. Just search for Tiger TV 14, all one word, on Vimeo. Click on the People option, and there you go. You're in. This is a low snap, and it's not dealt with well, although we might have a little bit of a run going here, and it's eventually going to be dealt with, but... At first, that looked very, very dangerous for the Tigers. Yeah, and you know, it is. This is just a disaster of a play for the Tigers. You give Birmingham Southern the ball in, in their own territory, almost in their red zone, and just not what you wanted to do there. I think Ranazeski didn't realize that the player who almost tackled him fell down in pursuit. So he may have had a chance to just get a quick rugby punt away there and at least get it a little further down the field. Now we're looking at, once again, the field position that I think we've seen this before. And you can see right here, the, just a really bad snap. That is not, not what you want to do there. Oh, and uh, Ranzeski just trying to make the most out of it as we come back to the live action. Missed a, uh, well, he didn't miss anything. Oaks threw the ball away to the left side of the field, but it will be second down and 10 now. They're going to have that three wide formation to the left once again, so you can expect a pass. Oaks goes that direction, but I'm not actually sure which receiver he was going to. Taylor, could you figure that one out? I'm not sure. I think it, I think that was another, you know, one of the a blown play by the Tiger offense, just not giving enough time for the quarterback to throw the ball. Well, actually, it did look like he had a lot of time. I think that was just a misthrown ball. Yeah, it looked like it might have been in the direction of Cole Merrill. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where he was throwing to, unless he was just trying to get rid of the ball. But it looked like he had still had time to throw. Pocket hadn't really collapsed, but important third down for the Tigers here. Yeah, an important third down for the Panther offense as well. This is not a well-thrown ball, and that is going to have a flag thrown. I was worried about that. Yeah, that uh, that's an unfortunate uh, pass interference call, and I'm uh, he's going for the ball there, Taylor. I have to say. I can see where you can throw the flag, but I, I I don't I don't I think I would have kept the flag in my pocket. That could be the Homer in me, it could be the Trinity Tigers, you know, coming out in me, but but I definitely would have kept that flag in my pocket. Yeah, and head coach Jeremy Urban raging at the bottom of your screen. You can see him there, almost walking onto the field in the black shirt, the black pants. Yeah, and you can almost read his lips from here that you know he's he's saying he's going for the ball, he's making a play on the ball. Yeah, and it's difficult to 
really argue against that. And, you know, you, you hate to see, you know, an official throw a flag at such a key moment of the game, potentially game-changing, you know, you know, penalty that, that could have gone either way. I mean, you could have you called it pass interference, but, you know, I don't, I don't think that was a pass interference call. No, I don't think so either, but C is going to take this one for no gain. So depending on the Tiger defense, that may not have any result. Of course, the pass interference call did give them the first down, but they're so close to the red zone. That is about all that it gave them. You're not really looking for more room to work with down at this level if you're looking to pass every play as they have been mostly doing in this fourth quarter since about the nine minute mark. And Oaks will take it again, flushed from pocket, had time, didn't need to do that, and he's gonna throw it away. And you see that a lot with young quarterbacks, Taylor, they just feel like their internal clock is running a little bit fast. Yeah, and that's the second play that he's really had a lot of time to throw the ball, and he's just either thrown it away or just made an incorrect you know, decision to throw the ball you know, to, to a spot that, that his receiver isn't at. And I think it benefits the Tigers, but it's not it's not something the Panthers really want to see out of their quarterback at this, at this moment. Yeah, tough to get a handle on that one. Oaks is going to have three to the left again, so it's going to be a pass. It's that same play. He goes back to the right this time, but a Tiger defender is there, and that is a great tackle. And that one looked like it hurt, and I think it did. Yeah, and you can really hear the Trinity fans getting into this one here. Rightfully so. What a great tackle. Oh. And I have been tackled like that. That hurts. And we very much hope that he's okay as he gets up number 44. Ford Hirsch, he'll get a hey, props to Ford for as he gets off the field. That is not an easy hit. After that. I could feel that one in my spine. I'm sure some viewers at home could as well as the Tiger defense is going to convene around defensive coordinator. Birmingham Southern are going to take a timeout to talk this one over and, and here's what a look do you do here? Well, here's a look at the uh, Tigers' field from last week. Luckily, we're playing in a lot of different, a lot different conditions than the mud game of 2018 over at Tiger Stadium, and I think it really changes the game. And I think you've seen the Tigers score a lot more points. You know, last week there was only a total of 14 points scored in the entire game until the last minute of the game, and I think, and I think that's really uh, contributed to the to the Tigers here and help the Tigers, you know, in an overall overall way, you know, execute more. Um, even though the Tigers, you know, would rather be playing on their home home grass field, it gives them an advantage that, you know, a lot of other teams don't really have. You know, they're used to playing on turf, but I think, you know, it, it, it's definitely changed the game, and it's and it's interesting to me to see how the Tigers have been resilient in, in adjusting to the, the changing field and, you know, just all the different weather that's – you know that's affected our our home our home stadium over the last I guess three weeks. You know with the rain in San Antonio, record rainfall, record September rainfall. Yeah, it's certainly been interesting to watch them attempt to adjust and attempt to adjust today. And with a fourth down and 20 coming up for this Panther offense, Taylor, what are you looking for here? I mean, I think I, I think they just got to stick their bread and butter. You know, you know they've got to either it's it's going to be a pass play. You know. You, but you got to get in that end zone or almost to it, the one-yard line. And here comes the pass. It's going to be lofted into the back of the end zone. And, and I think that was one that the Tigers gone. are very fortunate. I don't see any flags on the play. And that's what I was waiting for, a flag to be thrown, as you saw a similar play only a couple of downs earlier. Oh, and that, <laughs> I think because... Nick Hover got in front of the ball there and would have made a play on it either way. I don't think the flag was thrown, but the other defender had his back turned to it, and I see where he could have made the argument there, Taylor. It's one of those makeup calls. <laughs> we'll take it. And uh, those do happen, whether you like to admit it or not, whether you're a referee or a fan. And uh, this game looks like it's going to end 24-17. to as the Tigers take a knee, and they'll move back two yards or so. 
And uh, you have to say, pretty good showing for them overall. And most especially... Yeah, this is just a great, great win for the Tigers. You know, it's almost almost a road game. I say it's a road game because they're not at home. Um, but to have to move, you know, your stadium, your fans, your, uh, your broadcast equipment, and all your gear for the football team to a different stadium is it's an inconvenience. But I think this is a huge win for the Tigers to endure all that and then get a huge win. Great offensive victory for the Tigers. Absolutely, and it totally changes your preparation as well. We're going to run down... A couple of final statistics for you as this one is over. Trinity 24, Birmingham and Southern College Panthers 17. That'll drop them to 2-2, two and two, lift the Tigers to 2-2. Two and two. Wyatt Messick 13 of 22 for 225 yards, those two touchdowns, both beauties. Evan McDowell, 20 attempts for 82 yards. Charles Davis, 10 attempts for 81 yards. Wyatt Messick 10 attempts, only 5 yards on the ground for him. Your Trinity University receiving leaders, Chris Stewart, once again showing his skills. Five receptions for 92 yards, three receptions for Tommy Levine, 41 yards out of his three receptions, two touchdowns. How about that? Peyton Tuggle, one reception, 33 yards. Cash Crane, one reception, 31 yards. Austin Burton is one reception, 17. Matt Thompson, one reception, seven yards. And Evan McDowell with that little swing pass, one yard or excuse me, four-yard reception for him. For the Birmingham Southern Panthers, Trevor Oaks had 192 yards passing. Robert Shuford had 73 yards on the ground and uh, 81 yards for Wells Smith. Those are kind of your notables for them. Definitely an improvement for the Tigers, though, here, Taylor. Yeah, and I think, you know, as we look back at some of these plays from the first half, just kind of game-changing plays, the first one, you know, we're going to take a look at is I think, you know, one of the big things that the Tigers had that really helped them out was the, the, the interception that the Tigers had. You know, a lucky tip pass, but but something that the Tigers definitely needed and, and really came through with grabbing that pass to make their first turnover of the game that really, I think, swung the game in, 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 in Trinity's favor. You know, they were down 7-3, to three and, and I think, um, you know, ended up giving the Tigers a lot of momentum. Their defense was able to, to, to settle down and, and really, you know, give their offense a lot of, um, you know, firepower. And, and I think it, it allowed, you know, it opened, you know, the running game was opened up after that point, and I think that just swung the momentum right in the Tigers' favor, and I don't think Birmingham Southern ever really, you know, recovered from that play. And that was a beautiful run there from Charles Davis where he got most of his yards on the night. Yeah, and just an excellent game from Wyatt Messick too. You know, the receivers helped him out a lot and, you know, getting a lot of yards after the catch, getting open, but, you know, he played an excellent game using his legs and his arm. Yeah, and this is one of those great examples of using his arm. Beautiful throw there to Tommy Levine for the touchdown, one of Levine's three catches on the night. Yeah, and, you know, another storyline in this game is obviously going to be the, the turnovers for the Tigers. You know, they had two two excellent turnovers, a forced fumble and an interception, and you see right there just a great recovery for the Tigers. And, you know, that was a, that was a, a really pivotal play again just in the second half in the third quarter that allowed the Tigers to, you know, continue to – Continue that momentum and, and just, you know, keep that drive alive. Absolutely. All righty. Well, I think that about wraps it up for the, for the Tiger Network here. All right. Well, that will be us gone. Tigers will not return home until that October 20th Sewanee game at 1 p.m. If you're looking for some breakdowns of the next two games, though, that Rhodes game away on October 6th and the center game. October 13th. You can catch that on End Zone Wednesday at 5. Until then, we're going to be back next week with some different sports. But for now, I'm Sam McCorder, Taylor Stakes, all of the Tiger Network crew. Thank you so much for watching, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening as much as you enjoyed this Tiger win.